is Jessica Webster. And this is Sam Pogue of the Fitness Break Room podcast. Sit back, take a well-deserved break, and learn about the journey that helps shape the most successful fitness professionals in the industry today. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Fitness Break Room podcast. I'm your host, Sam Pogue, joined by my friend, Dr. Andy Galpin, uh, professor at Cal State Fullerton and author of the newly published Unplugged. Uh, thanks for joining me today while you're here in Austin. It's great to have you. You bet, man. My pleasure. So I had the luxury, uh, luxury, right? That's high, high level, uh, of meeting Andy officially at Paleo FX, or you guys were here for Paleo FX. Yep. And you rolled in with the Barbell Shrugged crew uh, for a little workout. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got to do a little play with the steel maces and the steel clubs, which is a ton of fun, explore some movement. Um, you know, a lot of people, when they see the clubs and the maces, it's like they want to keep them at an arm's like the distance because people are afraid of what they don't understand. Yeah. But what I love about your crew is like it's all about experience. Yeah. And they just roll in, like, give it to us. Like, we want to learn. Man, it was actually, I, I loved it um, for a lot of reasons because was, number one is, you know, for a lot of my life, I played college football. Uh, I grew up lifting weights, got into Olympic weightlifting at a very early age, did that. And I remember being probably 24 five or 26 and, and looking and doing something one day physically and then thinking to myself you haven't done anything besides squat hinge deadlift press <laughs> in like six years like, like oh my god and, I was, and then I turned 30 and I was like I, I need to move differently I can keep these movement patterns and I love those movement patterns for a lot of reasons but I had lost every ounce of athleticism I had also like things were not feeling great and then I, I did something one day I, I can't remember what it was I played pickleball or basketball or something. I was like, oh my God, I feel great. <laughs> I haven't done these, any of these, these non-programmed uh, movement patterns in a long time. Mm -hmm. And so um, it hit me very clearly. Like, I, I need to explore movement and I need to make it less about exercise and more about play, at least to have a balance there because I had lost that balance entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was really grateful for that. That Mace's or that Mace's Day? Mace's Mace, Day? Mace Day? Mace, Mace Day? Day? Yeah. Not this kind of Mace, like spray them in the yeah, 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 kind of Mace, yeah. but like Mace's the long metal objects. Yeah, so it was great, man. So I love that. We, we've actually changed quite a bit of my training um, at home in my garage. We've got some do implements and we do different stuff and uh, some complex stuff. And, and I, I just feel a lot better. That's awesome. Yeah, I have to do way less foam rolling. I have to do way less massage, way less um, stretching, mobility stuff when I just do movement like that. Yeah. I feel way better. I think there's something to be said for it. It's really easy to get caught up in all these rules in terms of yeah. I'm supposed to be able to squat, you know, 92% for whatever reps yeah, yeah. and I should be on this program and I need to be on undulating sets or whatever it is. And it's like, at the end of the day, like it's just exploring movement Yeah. and the strength community and then the educational professional realm sometimes don't always line up. Like, no. Sometimes it's like, okay, I'm the practical guy. I'm the engineer that can actually build a birdhouse, and you're the guy that can like tell me about calculus and how the birdhouse is, maintains its structure. Yeah. But the great thing, what I love about you is like you're both. You know, as much as you can be sit behind a desk and go through research and grab a cadaver and talk mm. to about uh, insertion points and recruitment, but then you can like you can actually go out and do it, right? You were an athlete, which I don't think are probably many professors that are um, like you. Well, actually, most of us are. Really? The vast majority of those sports scientists or whatever you want to call us were athletes. The difference is they stopped when they were done. Mm. Uh, most of them don't work out. They don't ever coach. They've never coached. So a lot of them were athletes, probably even up through college, but it's not it's not something they do anymore. They haven't done anything besides their one system. I think that's where I differ. Like I still work with athletes, uh, not a tremendous amount, but I, I still do. Uh, I still train. I, I'm not competing at the moment, but I'm, I'm itching to get back to yeah. competing. And, and that's where I think it's different. And also it's because I explore different types of competition. I competed in Olympic weightlifting. I played college football. Uh, I've competed in jiu-jitsu. I've done MMA. And so I've experienced different rules. And, mm -hmm. and I realized, wait a minute, the rules for weightlifting were different than the rules from football. Those were different when I was trying to add 15 pounds of muscle. And those were different than when I got into jiu-jitsu. So then wait a minute. If we step back, what were the rules that were similar between all of them. And can we filter that all the way down? We're like, actually, no, no, no. Here are the movement rules. And then here are the rules once we get into very specific scenarios. And then you start to think, well, if that's the case. Why do the rules even matter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell anybody that you're, that you're willing to break rules. That's whew. Yeah. And so it's like, I don't think of them more like rules. I think of them more like, okay, what can you do to hedge your bets? But that's about as far as I'm willing to go. It is a hedging of a bet. Mm-hmm. But there's no, there's no rule. There's no law. 
Um, and, and as we continue to expand our technology, and as we continue to expand our study of some of these specific things, we start to realize like, okay, remember this rule? Yeah, it turns out that's not true. Okay, remember this one? <laughs> okay, now, now I don't think that's true anymore. And I don't know how many times we have to have that happen mm -hmm. before we realize, okay, maybe we're approaching this whole thing wrong to begin with. It is important, I think, for people just starting to have some very specific rules. I give them some things. Okay, uh, never do this, never do this. Okay, great. And they go through the first six weeks, six months, six, whatever it is. And now they're ready. Now you can start going, okay, remember that rule I told you? Mm -hmm. Nah, it's not really. Huh? <laughs> I mean, this is what we generally do with our students. Uh, the first part of the semester, I teach them like, absolutely never do this, never do this, never do this, right? And they go through it and they learn, okay, and they learn the thing. But I can't break the myth mm -hmm. when they don't even know what the myth is yet. Right. So then we go, okay, remember rule one. Let's talk about when that's true, actually. And let's <laughs> talk about when that's that's not great. Yeah. And I can give you some really easy examples if you want. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just really pulling this off the top of me. Um, so one we use all the time is uh, the standard rule you're taught in strength and conditioning about never doing conditioning before your strength work. Mm -hmm. All right, so we can break that down. We can look at the research, and I can go through the research if you want on it. But it would basically say, just logically, if you do conditioning and you get really tired before you do something heavy, you're probably not going to be as strong because you're fatigued. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get stronger if you're not picking up something that's actually maximal. And it doesn't take a tremendous amount of logic to, to go, oh, okay, I see that. And the yeah. research would show you the exact same thing. So we would say never ever do conditioning before strength. Having said that, I remember sitting in a conference uh, with Joe Ken. Joe Ken's a head strength conditioning coach for the Carolina Panthers. Yeah. And, he, and he's phenomenal. He's great. And he walked up and he said, look, uh, we always do our conditioning before our, our speed work. And I was like, what? I think I was an undergrad or something. Like, oh, <laughs> like did he not go to like, <laughs> he, does he not know the basics of strength and conditioning? And I remember in my head going, wait a minute. Surely Joe Ken took that undergraduate sophomore class. Like, <laughs> he's been coaching for 20 years. Surely he knows this. Yeah. And so my gut reaction was, oh, he's an idiot. I know more than him because you're at uh -huh. that, you know, in your early 20s, you're... Not a good space. No. You're... <laughs> men don't think very well. I can't speak about women. I don't know if true or not, but I know men just... It's, it's, you're looking to be alpha mm -hmm. constantly. And then, but I had that quick jerk, and then I go, okay, wait a minute. Cut. He probably knows that. Let's assume, not that you're smarter than him, but let's assume he's onto something you don't know. And try to have that mindset, and it's, it's hard. But I was thinking, and he goes, let me explain to you. I used to do that all the time with uh, at Arizona State when he was coached there and with these guys. And what I found was these guys don't get super excited for speed work. I mean, if you've ever done any real, true, traditional speed work, you realize it's not very exciting. Mm -hmm. You don't get super tired. You don't get any of those rewards. So he's like, we weren't getting good effort. And so we tried different things and we, I went to different strategies and I wasn't getting any work. But I realized that when we do conditioning, they get all fired up, they compete, they get into teams. And so I can use that energy to get my speed work done. So he was like, if I do the conditioning first, mm -hmm. I get the energy, I get the involvement, I get the buy-in. Then when I do the speed work, they actually give me a decent effort. <laughs> and he felt like the lack of effort he was getting mm -hmm. originally was worse than the compromise in speed that they got from the, the conditioning. So overall, that's a net gain. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was one of the major things where I was like, Ah, uh, he knew the rule, mm -hmm. and he was able to break the rule for a very specific reason. That I think is an excellent reason. If you take the the famous Pablo Picasso saying, and it's one of those things where I'm not sure who the hell said it. Right. <laughs> Somebody said Pablo Picasso or Einstein, or apparently he said everything cool. Yeah. Socrates. I don't Aristotle. know. Right. So who knows if it's Picasso? But it was it was something effective. Learn the rules like a painter, so that you can break them like an artist. I love it. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. And, and that's how I really try to approach it is to say, yeah, we can give you rules initially. So when you're sorting this, this whirlwind of information now, rules do help. Mm -hmm. But as we evolve past that, we have to start understanding, when's it acceptable to break that rule? What are the consequences of that rule? Why are people telling me that? Mm -hmm. When you understand why they're telling you that that's a rule, and then you can understand, oh, okay, actually in this situation, I can break it. I know the potential consequence, so I'll, I'll be eyeing on, eyeing on that very specifically. And if I see any signs of that, we'll, we'll pull back. Or this is a potential problem. I can I can hedge my bet away from that. And if that's the only thing, then I can integrate and implement it. And I think that's um, that's how we can 
still have rules because it is important and helpful for people, but we have to realize like th these are just hedging your bet. They're just temporary sort of like actual rough guidelines. And if you really understand after years of experience what the potential consequences and what the potential benefits are, now we can really have productive conversations. So in my class, we're not, a, we're not allowed to say things like good or bad. There's no such thing as a good or bad exercise. There's, n there's only bad application. You did it at too much volume, did it too much intensity, did it with bad mechanics, you did it in the wrong situation, you made it too complex. There's not a bad exercise mm -hmm. though. And, and these, I have all these little like rules like that that you can go on and on and on about, but those are the examples of how I try to teach my students to think through things like this. And so when they come up to me and say like, is it true that A, B, and C? Ah, oh, mm, mm, I know I'm not allowed to ask that. Right. Because uh, yeah. uh, I don't answer, right? right? It's like, okay, well, let's talk about when it would be bad right. and when it would be good. Give me a situation. Okay, well, how would it potentially be bad in that situation? How would it be potentially good? Right. And then you answer your own question. Mm -hmm. So that's how we try to, that's why I try to help them start thinking through some of these things. So which classes do you teach, like, out there? Uh, I teach seven or so different classes. Seven different classes, oh my gosh. Yeah, they rotate. Um, I teach four per semester. Uh, I teach uh, exercise physiology, but not often. Uh, graduate, senior level, sports nutrition class, um, like a measurement laboratory sort of technique class, mm -hmm. but for strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. So different ways and testing methodologies that you might use as a coach. Uh, a graduate level strength class, like an applied strength class, um, a program design class. So building workouts, periodization, like this type of stuff. And then uh, a senior level principles of strength and conditioning. Do a class. lot of universities have like no such? I was gonna say no. Um, I don't come from the exercise science world. I was a business major, and uh, like you know, some of the kids I talked to, you know, not all of them were like Tony. Um, yeah. We have a very common friend. My my earliest mentor in fitness, uh, Tony Gracia, went to Linfield College with Andy and Doug Larson. If you yeah. guys follow the Barbell Shrugged podcast, and then they both played football at Linfield with my cousin Ryan Boatsman. Yeah. Uh, so a super small world. Ryan and I are from the same area, more or less, almost the same county. Like he grew up in Centralia, mm -hmm. I grew up in Kelso, Washington. We're like an hour apart. Yeah, um, yeah, so, baby, yeah. Yeah, super small world. Um, but most kids, like I've met, you know, exercise science or whoever, even master's programs, they're like they couldn't tell you anything in terms of application. They could tell me the insertion point mm -hmm. of where the bicep enters into their forearm. Yeah. But they can't tell me like, oh, well, what do the wrist flexors actually do and where are they applied for value, whatever. It yeah, is. we but, have one of the very few actual strength and conditioning undergraduate and graduate programs. Uh, you can get a master's degree focusing on these classes. I mean, we really spend a tremendous amount of time in these areas uh, because we realize that, you know, you can go anywhere and get a physical therapy right. free program. Uh, but if you really want to be a strength coach or anything anywhere related to that, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be... Like we, th there's a there's a demand for that. There's a huge demand huge for demand. that. So we built that out there, and we're just full of the brim every semester. Yeah. So we're huge. Well, we're there's so many massive. kids, and we talked about this before we get started. They go they go to school and they want to get their exercise science degree, and they maybe want to be a PT or a DC mm -hmm. or a strength coach, and then a lot of them end up becoming personal trainers. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with being a personal no. trainer at all. I did it. A, you did it. Did, yeah. It's a yeah. great industry. I Absolutely. loved it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but inevitably, I think a lot of people want to work with athletes. Yeah. Like the sexiness of working with LeBron or Cam Newton yeah. or Earl Thomas, like that's like the like, oh my God, that's going to set me up for success, right? Yeah, uh, well, okay, I'll, a couple of things on that. <laughs> uh, I have this conversation a lot with my students. Yeah, because this is, I get this all the time. And I'm like, great. Um, we were one of our grad students uh, who graduated a couple of years ago, a few months after graduating got a job with the Sacramento Kings and, you know, probably at age 24, a year or so after graduating from our program, he's the head strength conditioning coach for the Sacramento Kings. And we do have some other folks that, that go on to these fields, uh, but the vast majority of them don't mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, you don't necessarily know what it's like to deal with those people and you, you it may not be what you think. <laughs> and so a lot of people that even get those opportunities do it for a few weeks or a few months and like, oh my God, this is horrendous. It's secretly a bargaining game. Oh man, <laughs> there gets to a point where you're not coaching anymore. Uh -uh. Uh, if you get them to work out, it, it, yeah, it, it is negotiation the whole time, and you're really babysitting. And there's some exceptions. Some dudes For really sure. train. They love it. Uh, I got a friend that trains Odell Beckham Jr. It's like he do, do works he just constantly. Mm -hmm. I got friends that train a bunch of NFL guys, and, and okay, some of them are amazing. I was fortunate. The ones I was around, a lot of them trained their asses off, particularly like the old veteran offensive linemen and stuff. But the combine guys, the rookies, the sport, the skill guys, man, they're not trained. Yeah, 
They woke up. They don't have any real skills in the weight room, but they are the naturally the best athlete that walks onto a field. And they all they want to do is curl, bicep curls, or if they want to show up. So there's that. <laughs> uh, you also don't realize the time commitment. Oh my god. Um, you don't realize the salary. You're an assistant strength coach. You're probably making like thirty grand a year. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Right. If you got a job, if you weren't like unpaid intern for a couple of years. Oh yeah, years. Yeah, years. Yeah. Multiple yeah. rounds. Exactly. And multiple teams, and you're probably spending a couple of years in single A ball and Toulouse. Like you're just like you're over, and mm-hmm. and you got to get through that. People don't want to put in that work. Um, and they also don't realize that you're not going to get famous. And I, I want to really say that, yeah, like, I was like, you're not going to get famous as a strength conditioning coach. Mm-hmm. And that's honestly why people want to work with athletes. It's really not because they want to work with athletes. It's because they want to get famous. Yeah. And that's fine. Like, I'm not demeaning that. It, like, that, that's a really important thing for a lot of us. I get it. But that is a bad route. And I say this all the time. This is a great example. For any MMA fans, uh, even if you're not, you've probably heard of John Jones, right? Mm-hmm. Do you know who his strength coach is? Um, I, he's part of the Jackson Wink crew, isn't he? Sort of. Sort of. That's okay. my that's point. That's about though. the only, yeah, I know that, barely, and only because I worked on it. Like, I don't know anything, you know. Nobody knows who he is. Yeah. His name is Lawrence. He's fantastic. He is a tremendously smart coach, a great, great, great guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, does a lot for the community of strength conditioning. Fantastic. He trains John Jones, John Cerrone, a bunch of the highest, the best guy ever probably to yeah. do the sport, and no one knows who he is. He has like 600 Instagram followers. Mm-hmm. He's a really nice guy. He actually was just here during the durability course over the weekend. Oh, was yeah, he? Yeah, he was. I'm just trying to oh, go yeah. along with it. But yeah. Um, no, I mean, the, but that's the point. It's like, you know, people in the industry know who he is. Yeah. But n- he's not famous. Yeah. He, he couldn't, gen- he, if he sold a book right now, he'd sell one copy. Totally. He has no following. He has nothing on social media. He trains, like, he landed the gold mine. He hit the thing, like, he hit, John Jones is straight. Doesn't matter. Yeah. He's not going to get famous for that. He'll get famous because, oh, he's actually a good coach. Mm-hmm. Okay, people in the industry really respect him. I follow his stuff. I read his stuff. I'm like, okay, he's, he's really, I go to his clinics. When he puts on workshops, like, I'm going. He's really, really talented. But you're not going to get famous that way. And, and so I hammer my students with that. I'm like, if you're really honestly doing this for fame, find another path. Yeah. You won't get it. A couple of people, Joe Ken, 1,000, 1,100 followers mm-hmm. on Instagram. Nothing, right? There's, there's probably... How many girls walking up and down these halls with 35,000 that don't know? Pretty much everybody. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and they're all sure lovely and smart people. That's, yep. that's not what I mean by yep. no, it. No, absolutely not. But the point is, like, that, that's not what, you're not going to get there for that. Yeah. If that's your true purpose, be honest with yourself and go, okay, you got to rethink your strategy here because that's not going to get you there. Mm-hmm. So. And that's a super good nugget, guys. Uh, and not, it doesn't take away from the passion that you want to put into it, mm-hmm. but it takes, it needs to play into the reason why you're there because. You can Thank only you live on your passion yeah. for two years before it's, it's all of a sudden over. Like, yep. you know, everybody's got to eat at some point. Especially and... when that passion comes with no money and you're not sleeping and you're at the whim and beck and call of somebody. And then you start to realize this person really doesn't care about me. Yeah. This person's totally, absolutely using me. That's not always the case. Uh, and, and I'm not like people, I know people that are NFL strength coaches and they love it. Mm-hmm. Like they just love it. Or they're high school strength coaches or whatever. Division three, they love it. And that's great. And if you do love it, please, please, please do it. Yep. But absolutely. just make sure you understand really why you're doing it first before you step in, get five years in your career and go, I fucking hate my life. Mm-hmm. Like, don't, <laughs> I don't want you to be in that position. So well, I've had the conversation with a few of our guys around here and they're like, I go, do you know why some of these coaches don't have big Instagram followings? It's because they don't want to get found. Like that too. Like, <laughs> There's that too. That, yeah. Like how many people find out like, oh, uh, you're the head strength coach with the Blazers or Stanford. Yeah. Like, immediately most people's reaction especially when you're younger in your career is to sell them like this is what i'm doing like i've got the program that you're not doing that you've never heard of i've got the ticket that's going to make your athlete the best athlete what are you going to give lebron that's going to make lebron a better basketball player nothing nothing no nope. not hurting him nope like, i think that, he hasn't heard it before yeah come and on so it's like it doesn't like these guys don't want to be consistently pitched on stuff no nope. on the other end half of them are like you know a lot of the answer is like i don't have time to post it because they work really shitty hours yep. right there's no off season Yep. Um, and if you go to like MLB, like they're not a part of the players union. Nope. Like they don't get pensions at the end of the year, right? God, and you know, you hope you win the World Series, so you get a check at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. But you're working for Nuggets compared to the dude that's like, oh man, I make twenty five million a year. Who the f are you? Yeah. Right. And your your job is very volatile in yeah. terms of uh, if you know the right fielder who's making twenty million a year wants you gone, you're probably gone. Yeah. And if he doesn't want you gone because he doesn't like the color of your hair, like you're gone. Doesn't yeah. really matter. 
And that doesn't always happen. But if you look around, you know, the average tenure for strength coaches in professional sports is a couple of years before they get kicked around to the next place. Mm-hmm. Like, and even then, like I was talking to, I'm not going to name names, but a prolific strength coach for a very large uh, baseball organization. Yeah. And uh, he was kind of like, what's your angle here? Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Like, I'm on the industry side. Like, you do a very specific job and you do a very good job of it. And I'm not yeah. in your shoes. However, you can't help. That your athletes are going to leave you at the end of the at the end of September or October, yeah. and they're going to go to guys like me. Yeah. So I'd rather have a really good relationship with you and say, "Hey, look, this is kind of what I want to do with him, or this is what we're mm-hmm. working on, mm-hmm. and let's communicate across that pattern." As yeah. opposed to, I'm doing half kneeling, uh, un, you know, bottoms up kettlebell presses on a Bosu ball or whatever, yeah. and then they come back to you for the season, and then they're injury plagued all year yeah, yeah. because they spent two months doing herky shuffles and speed sprints and the whatever, yeah. and then you're like. Now, but whose job's on the line? Not yeah. mine. Yeah, yeah. You're I right. get to show an Instagram yeah. post that I was training whoever, and now I look like the king, and you're the one who might get fired for the shit that I did. For so sure. Let's communicate better across that. Yeah. So it actually brings up something else. I don't even know. If this is pretty tangential, but uh, I think it's an important point for anybody in these shoes of coming up. I try to uh, to make sure I harp this on my students all the time. Is when you're trying to pitch somebody like that, um, and you're trying to get a job, or you want to do those things, it is uber important that you do not ask them for anything like do not ask them for anything yes you have to add value back to them like what can i do for you coach that's how you sort of get people's attention but when i get emails all the time asking me to do a bunch of shit for you (laughs) i'm out like oh i'd love to do this and i'll come work for you but can you do this from in and oh we're negotiating now no like you add value to me in a conversation yeah. Like, what can I do? You know, like, what do you expect in return? Nothing. And let her wreck. Nope, I don't expect anything in return. I'll be there every morning. I'll, I'll wipe the floors. I'll clean all the machines. And I, I'm just wondering if I can be in the background, maybe catch some stuff. At the end of the six weeks, and I'm out of here. Thank you very much. Like, there's zero expectation on my end. Oh, okay, great. Now you potentially got my attention. But if you come in and, and we start, and like, you do this for this, well, because my time is not equal to your time. Yep. I didn't win. I lost. Yep. And you have to make sure if you, when you're trying to move up that pecking order, Add value to them and do not expect or demand anything in return. Yeah. Anything. I get this one all the time. Like, oh, come and volunteer your lab, whatever, if I can pick your brain. No. Stop right now. No. If we probably have some time, maybe. But I'm not, when this is not an exchange. Yeah. I don't run a program where I exchange hours for, for conversation. Like, this is not what I'm interested in doing. Obviously, if you have any brains on you, you realize there's probably going to be 15 minutes here and 20 minutes there. And you're in there realizing, I, I'm, I will definitely, and you're going to get that. Mm-hmm. You will get that out of it. But if you come asking for things and you turn it into a bunch of stuff I have to do for you, then I'm not interested and people up there are not interested in it all. So you wanted to get famous because you want to get with my athlete. No way. Yeah. Like you want to see if your system works so that this athlete will then do testimony. I can see that. I yeah. see what you're doing and I'm not interested. Yeah. Like they're not interested. I'm not going to put my athletes in that position. No. Like we have to understand the value proposition here, which is everything's got to come from your end and expect nothing on the end. And then you're probably going to get some value return. You know, prior to this, uh, you were kind of under the radar and, you know, you worked with a lot of prestigious athletes. You know, you've worked with a lot of uh, high level uh, thought leaders in this industry. Mm-hmm. And you recently just wrote a book and, and it's gotten a lot of attraction. You were on the Rogan podcast. Obviously, that helps. Have people started treating you differently, knowing your story a little bit more? Uh, I don't really know if I'd sort of. I haven't done many shows where people have really talked about my story that much. Good. It's mostly been um, extraction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mostly like they're using me. Like, I got to get a bunch of information out of this dude. Yeah. And they're not super interested in in, in that end of it. But has it been treated differently? I I think so in a little bit. Um, I definitely have gotten a lot more of the random stop like oh my god i saw you in rogan you know know, things like that (laughs) and i've got a lot more people email me wanting stuff Uh uh-huh uh and to which like i just chuckle because i'm like i'm not gonna respond to that Mm -hmm. uh i i I respond to a decent amount of people that reach out to me because i honestly do feel like all right if you if i can help you and i don't take them fine but there's certain rules uh if you send me a twitter message and you're like yo dude wondering what kind of uh, nutrition i should eat (laughs) out Food. You send me you send me an email, Dr. Galpin. Thank you so much for your time. I'll keep this brief. Super fan. I read this and read this. I'm at hoping you can maybe possible clarify. Okay, I'm probably gonna respond to that. Mm-hmm. Did you even take the time to look for the answer yourself? Yes or no? Oh, you did. 
and then you read the okay now i'm probably gonna answer but one of his questions like man i had a question about muscle fi physiology i'm wondering what kind of fiber types are there and you didn't realize i have seven hours of free information on my <laughs> website about that delete like i'm not yeah. responding you didn't do the due diligence you didn't respect my time enough mm -hmm. to do a fucking google search look the first thing that came up like so that type of stuff like i'm out mm -hmm. i'm not doing anything other than that like that has probably increased more than anything which is people asking me for stuff and acting like i have a responsibility to oh. answer your questions and they're bitter Sometimes and they're so mad bitter. like so mad you don't have time to fucking answer one question and you're like no i don't who, who and you don't you deserve, you don't deserve it. ask that yeah like how entitled are you <laughs> i don't have any response i got dude oh i get so fired up when i get um because I try to post a, a lot of the science and stuff we do on mm -hmm. our social, and I put that stuff up there, and I'll post a picture, say, of the title, and then people will just comment left and right, send me messages. Where can I find the study? Hashtag, are you kidding me? Google? Like, the title. <laughs> Google it. Have you seen that website? Let me Google that for you. Yeah. Oh, glorious. My favorite thing. Glorious. I wish I could do that a bunch, but I'm like, I, I don't even respond. Like, that type of stuff has gone up a lot. Yeah. And, and I'm like, I am not, I, I love this saying, um, I'm a big hip hop fan. Yeah, like we're talking about. I'm a huge hip hop fan, and there's this guy, Brother Ali, fantastic rapper, and uh, he, I'll modify a little bit, but he, he has this line where he says something like, um, "Look, I don't think God is obligated to touch you. If your ass would rather sit and shit than work a shovel." <laughs> and I'm like, "Yes, that's yes. Great. That's a great if line. you would rather just sit there and drown in in your shitness." Rather than work your way out of it, I will not help you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to come by and help you. I'm not going to dig you out of it. If you're digging your ass off and going, dude, I'm getting overwhelmed. I'm digging my ass off here. Can you give me a ladder? And I'm, I'm dude, I'll give you the biggest ladder I got. Yeah. But you got to do your part, man. You got to do your work. You got to Google search it. And mm -hmm. if you Google search it and read it, hey, I'm, ask, I'm probably going to respond to you. But if it's just like, I'm sitting here, I'm drowning, and uh, I know there's a ladder over there, but it's three feet away. I'm just wondering if you come pick me up, dig me out of here for me. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. I'm not yeah. doing it. Sorry. I don't know. If this, no, I, I just cast you. I yeah. wanted to make sure I set that tone that way you could do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, you know, I th and I, I've given a few talks about networking and and, uh, and how that all comes into play. And this is a really good lesson in terms of being an effective networker. Yeah. Because uh, it's not that he's um, objective to helping people out. It's just that. No, no. Dude, I, so I spent much, so much time on yeah, that. Yeah. You spent seven hours of free footage right there. Like, go into it prepared. Go into it with a servant attitude. You know, across the board of everybody you've heard on the podcast, everybody's got this attitude of servant uh, mindset and, and helping. Yeah. However, it also comes to the play of how much you're able to give and, and what allows you to proliferate yeah. what you're trying to do because you still have goals and aspirations that yeah. you want to get to. And, and I'm not like, you know, my, my wife calls me like an e minus list celebrity. <laughs> yeah, like, so I can't even imagine what it's like for even somebody like Aubrey, let alone somebody like Rogan. Yeah. Right. So, so those interactions, you have got to respect that sometimes they're fried. Mm hmm emotionally like totally. sometimes they're just done and if you get a bad reaction from them you cannot take that personally mm -hmm. you gotta swallow and go probably my fault i probably approached that situation wrong yep i mean i'll just tell you uh, i will talk to anybody at a conference or whatever if i'm there i'm there for that purpose yeah that's why i'm there so please you know come up and talk to me but the approach has got to be appropriate uh you know i usually react really well to things like Oh, hey, Andy. I don't care if you call me doctor. Like, you know, hey, Andy, uh, saw you on this show. Like, really thought it was great. Um, thank you for all you do. Whatever, things like that. Uh, hey, you know, I know I know you're busy, but do you have one second for a quick... I'm like, sure, man, go. Yeah. Or even if you stop right there and just give me the thanks, I'm probably to go, oh, hey, man, it's great, Sam. Great to meet you. Like, what do you do? And then we're going to... I'm like, oh, great, you do this. Oh, awesome. And then we're probably going to have a pretty good conversation mm -hmm. and you can get your question or your mm -hmm. thing answered. I react really poorly to the walk up and go, Hey, Andy, you got a question. I'm like, who the f like, whoa, huh? Like, yeah, yeah, I'm not interested. Or yeah. like, how do I do this? What? Uh, who, who are you? <laughs> uh, uh, all right, I'm not like, and I'm not looking for the gratitude. I'm not looking for the like the bow down to me, worship me, then I'll help you, you little mm. peasant. It's just that a value of exchange. Like, I don't owe you anything. I gave away everything on my website for free. I don't have a newsletter to sign up for. There's not a membership. Nothing costs anything. I spend a ton of time on Facebook that I could be spending or, uh, on my social that I could be spending with my wife or my friends or my or my own self, right? Mm -hmm. I give a lot. Yep. So when you ask me to do it again, at least give me just an ounce of respect before yep. you do that. And I'm probably willing to be like, oh yeah, cool. Cause because I generally am like a teacher. I want to help people. Yeah. That that's what I default to. But like you just have to give just come in, just come an inch. Yeah. Just, just come an inch to me and then I'll be like, oh yeah, sure, I'll help you. Which is super important for people. Yeah. But I think people also need to understand that you weren't always the guy at the front of the room. No. You were them. You were that person too at once upon a time. I still am. You were lowly, you know, undergrad. 
Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into the exercise space in general, like what took you to Linfield, what made you want to be in exercise science and, and going off to University of Memphis and, and going to get your PhD? Uh, well, I mean, I grew up, you know, in Rochester, Yep. Uh, which is like a small, I don't want to call it farming town, but like a little country town Yeah. Uh, for the most part, mostly loggers and, you know, things like that around. Uh, and, and, and I don't know if anybody from my graduating class of 80 people, uh, I don't think a single person besides myself went off to a four-year school. Prior to me, I think only my older brother and a few other people had ever left and played a college sport outside like community college basketball mm-hmm. or something. Um, so, you know, I, I just grew up, I, I love sport. Uh, I had a really good culture there. I had a great older brother, a great family system, uh, and a great facility that, that promoted sport and mm-hmm. promoted those things and promoted really uh, this attitude that like they don't care about wins and losses or sports success like that. It was never highly, I, mean, I didn't get, I'm great. I try to win, yeah, of course, but like, really care about things like that. Although we're a very, very competitive family, yeah. But it was just more of like, what's unacceptable is quitting. Mm. Um, on like people, you know, Mm -hmm. it's okay, like, like take a knee when the game's over, like, you know. But or I don't want to play this year anymore because I didn't like it. Oh, that's fine. Cool. No, no worries. Mm -hmm. But it was unacceptable to be late. It's unacceptable to when you said you're going to be there and then you gave a half effort. It's unacceptable to lose because you didn't want to work hard enough. Mm-hmm. If you didn't want to do it, fine, don't do it. Um, but don't commit to other people, especially in a team sport when other people now have committed all this stuff and they quit their job after school so that they can do this and now right, all these things. So those were things that were unacceptable. And so I, I, I just sort of grew up like that. And, and so because then I'm like, I was 12, 13, something like that. And I was like, okay, I got to start working out. And so I started lifting weights and we just started getting there. And I played sport, and I was, you know, better than most in high school, mm-hmm. and had a lot of success in that level, and, and had the fortune of of having some interest from colleges and going on some recruiting visits and things like that. Um, but I mean, I knew I was I had no like real future, right? In sport, like it wasn't you know, Division three, right? I and mean, Linfield's not a shit program either, though. No, National it's a championship. Yeah, you were there for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't actually think I lost a single regular season game in my career. Yeah. Uh, so we were pretty good, but like, you know, UW wasn't calling anytime soon. <laughs> like, <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. Central wasn't calling. I yeah. wasn't going to play uh, anything besides that. Uh, and I knew that. Um, but I, I, like, for me, training was the difference between, um, particularly in college, like, that was the difference between playing a lot as a sophomore or versus probably not making the team. Mm-hmm. But that was the difference between starting as a junior and not playing that was the difference between getting awards and maybe rotating and so for me there was a very there was a carrot Mm -hmm. i was good enough to where i was incentivized and i had success when i worked really hard Mm -hmm. but i wasn't so good that hard work didn't matter so it put me in that really sweet spot of going like you got to figure it out because if you do the wrong training program that might be the difference between you getting on the field this year yeah or you rotating also, if you do work hard and you pick and you and you really make sure you study and you do your homework to get the right training stuff down, you, you can get there. You're going to get this success and you're going to get to play. So that's probably where it all started. I, I just had that carrot really well lined up. Um, so my lack of athleticism, <laughs> but my little bit of athleticism okay, sort, like of, sort of put me in that right spot. <laughs> so that's kind of where it all started Okay, um, for the most part. And then did you go into school knowing you wanted to be in exercise science or knowing that that was a direction that you wanted to go? <laughs> Well, I mean, yes and no. Like, I wanted to go into college, learn how to be a better athlete so I could play. Because <laughs> <I wanted, laughs> a perfectly acceptable answer. I wanted to play college football. Yeah. Um, and meet girls and the the accolades that go along. Oh, yeah, 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 right. You've been to Linfield, bro? <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> There's, what, nine of them there? My, girls. My, uh, <laughs> my freshman year, Playboy ranked us, like, third ugliest in the country or something oh, like that. Oh, that's... At least you were on the ranking of something. I, I swear <laughs> there was, like, a 12 to 1 guy-to-girl ratio, too, just... Uh, not 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 the school for that. Um, but you had great football and great baseball. Great football and great baseball. Yeah, and and very good academics. Yes, very uh, good honestly, school. like that's what that's what I went for, also as well. I, yeah, uh, I knew that this is going to be a, a pretty good place um, to get there. But no, when I was on my recruiting trips, I kept telling them like I like I like to study. Like you know, I like I like learning about like muscle and science. Like this stuff's cool. But you know the high school I went to. I don't know how Kelsey was like. It's got to be the same way. We're like we didn't have AP chemistry. We had it, but it wasn't like it was oh, a good thing to go do. We didn't have anything. Yeah. Like, we had physical science in my freshman year. 
my senior year was like first period was on the tractor building the, the softball field second period was weight training third period was ta for weight training fourth period was you know what my one academic class <laughs> i was like i was not prepared for an academic degree at all i felt that though for sure not even close right so uh, i was going to recruit this and i'm like i don't know like i want to study like science and stuff like that was pretty cool in middle school because like last time i got to learn science <laughs> i'm like hopefully about human proton yeah. neutron electron for a dude oh my God. i remember my freshman year brother taken an anatomy class and everyone had already taken anatomy class I'm like what do you mean like oh yeah i took ap anatomy in high school i'm like are you kidding me and i'm just getting hammered in classes and i'm like oh my god you gotta learn all this stuff like what the hell is a humorous like i don't know every kid had already known that before and they, they find it. that funny yeah oh come on no. so uh i was going to training visits anyways and i was like and so i was like oh, okay well we can do athletic training and i was like that sounds great like that's okay and i learned no 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 i don't want to tape ankles for a living right all love to all you other trainers out there i know you do way more than that but my point was like i don't want to do that yeah and i'm like oh physical therapy you work with people I'm like no 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 like i want to do something where you can like make people better at sport like mm-hmm. is surely there's a degree like that and everyone's like no we don't have anything like that there wasn't really kinesiology and exercise science right like it wasn't really there we had eventually linfield had an exercise science program but it was very clinically based mm-hmm. it was epidemiology it was let's get people walking more and so we can reduce cardiovascular disease and elderly like there was no sport twist at all there was no performance based nothing related to that so when i graduated i was like i don't know what i want to do um but i got i got the job at adidas which is actually you know the pretty decent story um that we can kind of circle back into yeah. of how i got that if you remind yeah, me yeah let's do it but i eventually um doug and doug had a mentor in um in uh, Washougal that he lifted with and he was like hey why don't we go to this NSCA conference the National Strength Conditioning Association mm-hmm. and I'm like there's this conference like that that sounds awesome <laughs> like I had no idea what the NSCA was I mean I'm graduated already yeah. and I still didn't know yeah. any of these things uh, and I'm like that sounds great so he's like well that you can take this exam thing called the Certified Strength Conditioning Specialist and you can have a certification I'm like oh, that sounds great CSCS for those of you who are following along at home exactly <laughs> so we drove overnight from portland to vegas we show up uh doug and i <laughs> we're like studying the textbook <laughs> on the drive that's so funny like, no preparation at all we're flipping through stuff and and we drive there we're the last people we walk into the door and there's like 200 people taking this exam at the same time we walk in like five minutes before it starts i'm like oh my god we almost missed it because we happened to get into town right before it started probably smelling awesome oh it didn't shower up on cheetos and oh yeah right like didn't sleep the night before straight in doug was the first one out i was the second person out oh i'm sure a lot of kids were pissed (sighs) who the fuck are these guys i couldn't believe i'm like this is easy especially the practical application portion like the science was a little harder but uh, you know, not much. Sorry for all of you that have failed oh my that test the first time. <laughs> that might be like, who is this guy? Well, it was easy for me because I done so much of the training. Yeah, I knew what a good forty yard dash was. I knew what a vertical jump was. Like this is a, this is what I did, and what I paid attention mm-hmm. to. So that part of it was was pretty easy. Um, I didn't do great in academics, by the way. Again, I told you about my high school. Like I was not academically prepared. <laughs> I got like a thousand on the SATs, just which is not a good score. The and now he's a PhD, folks. <laughs> the bare minimum to get into Linfield is like 1300 yeah and they're like eh, like academic <laughs> head football coach like moves some things nice on that one <laughs> uh, uh, yeah well other stuff yeah so, <laughs> don't throw him under the bus yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> he's still coaching yeah you know. um, not Linfield but so we, we go to this conference and uh, I don't know what to do like I have no idea and you know, the guy Mark is, is walking us around and he's like, well, there's all these posters and these people stand in front of their posters and they present their research. And I'm like, oh, okay, people can do research on sport? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, I had no, I, like, yeah. I had no idea. And, and they're giving out free food and beer. And so Doug, <laughs> where am I? This is yeah, Mecca. <laughs> this is fantastic. And it's in Vegas. So, you know, Doug and I are crushing beers and we got a couple, like we're getting two beers at a time each. And we walk by and a guy, this old guy's, uh, that oldish guy is standing there by a poster. I'm looking at his poster and it was something like the effects of muscle signaling program of uh, proteins on uh, acute high intensity squatting with bands and chains. And I was like, I, I squat with bands and chains, you know, like <laughs> I just figured that out on my own. Yeah. I lived with them. I'm like, but you do muscle biopsies and look like protein stuff. 
what? <laughs> this is incredible. And he had another poster, something like, uh, you know, Snatch and Clean and Jerks and then some, some other stuff. And I'm like, and, and Doug and I are just floored. Mm. And we, we start talking to this guy and start asking him question after question. Go get more beers, get him some beers. So like <laughs> six beers in and then the posters are over. He's like, hey, you guys want to go grab, uh, you know, some drinks over here? Yeah, yeah. So we go sit there. We just like, bur- I'm we're just getting hammered. I'm bombarding this guy with questions. And he loved it though, probably. Oh, he's, he's, he's eating it up, right? Yeah. And we're just hammering him. He's loving it. We're just talking shop. And uh, he's like, hey, what are you guys? You know, and we're like, just tell him. He's like, you guys, you know, interested in getting a master's degree? And we're like, what the hell's that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any idea. And, he, and we're like, well, I don't know, if it, like, is that four years or some, like, what is that? Like, I don't even know. Like, and he explained it to us. And he's like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a professor at the University of Memphis, and this is what I do. And he's like, I got a couple spots over the next year. And, and that ended up being our interview for grad school. That's awesome. It was right then. And it ended, it ended up being a guy named Andy Fry. Who's won several sports scientists of the year awards. Like he's done all this stuff, this monumental stuff. And, and uh, that's how we got out to Memphis for our master's degree. And I'm like, I don't even know what I was getting myself into. But I'm like, I don't know, dude, if we're going to go study this type of stuff, like I am fucking in. Let's go. So like eight months later, he was like, hey, you guys still want to come out in the fall? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so that, that's how I ended up getting there. And the, my master's in human movement sciences, but it, it's the same, you know, like, Knees yeah. and it's all the same. What's yeah. your favorite beer, by the way? Uh, it depends on the day. Okay. Uh, I think if I was to give you one right now. IPAs are super overrated. Okay. Okay. I, I love me hops, but like, I feel like you can't make a decent beer without it being just six hundred IBUs right now. I'm like, we can make a better one. Uh, I've been jamming a lot on really skunky pilsners. Mm. So if you see Andy at an SCA national conference or coaches conference this year. A skunky pilsner dude might stop him to get a conversation in. I'll be at uh, <laughs> personal trainers this weekend, actually Friday. I go back Thursday speaking for trainers. I'll be at coaches conference in uh, Carolina in January. I'll be there as well. Are you really? Yeah. Awesome. Dude. Let's yeah. Hang. Vince and I are both there. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Cool. So we'll be there. We'll go get dinner. I'm talking. I'm actually talking about the book there. Oh, perfect. Even better. Yeah, which would be cool. Uh, yeah, that'll always work. Or you know, any, I'm good for a crafted beer. You know, I can't really miss. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, I actually I think I think porters and stouts are underrated too. Mm-hmm. Super underrated. Thankfully, we lived in a very nice area for that, oh, uh, and the, the, the brewery scene didn't really pop into fruition when we were there. Nope. I mean, it started when I left. I left in two thousand fourteen, so we'd already been up and going. But by the time oh, yeah, you yeah. left, when did you leave the Northwest? Uh, two thousand four. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, because I hopped out. I went from Linfield to Adidas, uh, and then Adidas to Athletes Performance, and then from there. Uh, basically to Memphis. So. so what was that Adidas for you? Oh, oh, okay. So this is a, I, I have so many stories like this. Uh, I, this is the type of things when people ask me about success. Like, how did you get this job? Um, I worked for a place called Athlete Performance in Tempe. And that was the first of its kind. It's now Exos for any of you people. Mark Verstegen, head of the NFLPA and stuff like this. He's a legend. Back then it was exclusive. They had one facility and I got a gig down there. And it only trained elite professional athletes. And I was just out of school when I, as I just explained to you, like I didn't necessarily have like <laughs> a lot. I didn't know what I was doing in, yeah. in regards to those. I'm like, how the hell did you get down there? And it's, 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 it's simple and it's easy. Every single time I've got a big brick, how I got on Joe Rogan, how I got on all these things, it's always the same thing. Um, a lot, I had so many people asking about Rogan because I was on Rogan's show two weeks before my, or two weeks after my book came out. Yeah. And everyone's like, man, your publicist is good. No, no, no. He didn't even know I had a book until the last 10 minutes of the show. He asked me, he's like, what else? I'm like, oh yeah, I got a book. He's like, really? What about, it had nothing to do with that. That's awesome. Completely irrelevant. I didn't reach out to any friends, have them ask him. Like, Joe followed me and then Joe came after me. And and that's a whole nother story about how you do that. But like, it doesn't work by pulling strings like that. You're not going to get in front of people's eyes like that. Mm-hmm. He's got, do you know how many people know friends that know him? He's getting a thousand of those texts a day. It's yeah. not going to work. Right. I work it on it and I still can't talk. I don't know Joe. I can't. Yeah, like, right. I get messages all the time like, hey, can you send this to Joe? No. And I'm like, I mean, you know, when Andy sent me uh, his books, like I did put them on Aubrey's desk. I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah. I know he gets a lot of them and, and then here it is. But, but right? if you remember, I specifically texted you back. I'm like, don't, yeah. like, you don't have to do that. Totally. I'm not sending them to you, Sam, so that you'll get them to Aubrey to get them to Joe Rogan. I'm sending you to Sam because you did me a real solid and you put me through a fantastic training session and I felt like I owed you. Um, that was because you just donated that time. And yeah. so, like, that was a good exchange. And like, if, if I want to great, but I don't care at all. Totally. 
That's not why I'm sending that's it. That's why mutually exclusive things are great. Like, because I don't feel like I did anything. I just got to go hang out with these cool guys. Yeah, I know. So but like, that's why it's great. But, but that's like, uh, you know, I love people. Like, I, this is one thing I matured on. Like, I don't ask for free stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. And I realized, like, at the beginning of my career, I did a lot of things for, like, hoping, out of, hoping I got a free T-shirt or something out of it. Now I'm like, actually, go buy it. Like, somebody has something that you really like. Go buy it. Go mm-hmm. support it. Yep. Go do it. Uh, I was just on Zach Evanes's podcast this morning, and I was going to send him a book. He's like, no chance. He's like, zero chance. I'm buying it. Mm-hmm. And I've had so many friends that I work with. No, no, you're not sending me a free one. I'm buying it. I'm like, uh, that's what professionals do. Mm-hmm. Like, the, they respect each other's time. So when they give you something, you go, okay, let me let me return that for you. It's the same Here. for you guys as personal trainers. Like, all your friends are like, oh, man, you can train me for free. It's like, dude, it's your time. Like, that's how you mm-hmm. pay your bills. That's how you go out and grab beers with them. Like, you want me to be able to buy around with y'all? Yep. I need to make money during that hour. Nope. Like, not. it's fitness is such a unique thing where, like, people think it's free. Like, time I can go to Whole Foods run. and be like, no. I haven't had this version of milk yet. Can I get this one for free? Yeah. What? Yeah. 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 Uh, have you had milk before? Well, yeah. Then no. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Jessica here. I just wanted to pop by to give you a friendly reminder to enter into our Fitness Industry Night giveaway, which we do every month. For this month, we're in February 2018. It's sponsored by our friends at On It. Thanks, On It. They're giving one of you a pair of those awesome Captain America Shield barbell plates. These are those really nice urethane bumper plates, so they're like those solid discs, not the crumb rubber ones. They're really low bounce, which is a great quality for plates, especially for those of you who use them for wads. They don't go, you know, flying around, bloodying your shins or like breaking mirrors. To enter to win, go to our website, fitnessbreakroom.com, and just leave your name and email on the entry form. And basically, we'll let you know if you won or not at the end of the month. For extra entries to win, you can email me a screenshot of your review you left us on iTunes. If you decide to do that, that's awesome. Thank you very much. You can share the contest on Facebook, on Twitter. You can email it to a friend. We're just trying to make it as easy as possible to share the love of the podcast and free to win free stuff. So it wins for everyone. Also on our website, you can find a video version of all of our VIP interviews like the one you were listening to before I interrupted. And a bunch of other resources we've come across that have made a huge impact on our careers and people we've known in the industry. So definitely go check that out. We keep the website pretty up to date. So every time you go, you should find something new. Okay, that's it for me. Enjoy the rest of the show. And thanks so much in advance for your reviews and your support. Um, so anyway, you're so done every, at every break I've ever gotten is the point is something like this has happened. It's, it's all because I did something for somebody else mm-hmm. with nothing in return. And if you do that enough, you're going to catch these breaks. So I was at Linfield, and I had uh, my professor there. I told you they were really clinically based. And so she wanted to set up a booth outside for a health wellness kind of day. Mm-hmm. Set up a booth outside where we can take blood pressure. So people walking around, they can get their blood pressure checked and do those things. She's like, does anyone want to do it? And nobody put their hand up. And I'm like, I'll do it. And she's like, great. Uh, well, don't you have football practice? And don't you have um, uh, yeah, all this? Uh, you got to go train and then you got to lift. You- yeah. Yes. Uh, when can you do it? I can do it at um, the only time I have. I got an 8 o'clock class, so I can do it at 630. You're going to come? Yeah, I'll do it. Do you know how to take blood pressure? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> do you, uh, are you interested in doing? Cl- nope. Why are you doing it? Well, you said you need help. Let's do it. Why not? Yeah. This is only going to help people, right? And it's only time. Sure, no problem. At that stage of my life, like the answer is yes, right? Mm-hmm. So I did it, and I sat out there, and it was cold and rainy. And not a person came by. I don't want to do blood pressures. I never want to do blood pressure again. I didn't want to do it at the time, like, <laughs> but I knew like this person needed help. It was for a good cause. Sure, I'm in. Mm-hmm. Six months go by, nine months go by, or something. I don't know. Somebody reached out to her, who was a former graduate of our program, who is now a manager or something at Adidas, and said, "Hey, do you have any students that uh, want to do effectively like corporate wellness?" This is also something that was not around. Right. 12 years ago or whatnot and she's like uh I kind of thought through that it was like i don't know like but i know a guy who's really into performance stuff and he's just a great worker so she emailed me hey do you want this job absolutely let's yeah. go yeah. like i'm in right i want to make money i thought i was going up there to be a strength coach mm-hmm. i got there and i realized i'm doing corporate wellness good yep good you, this is what, now i don't want to do this great but i'll do it absolutely why because yeah. it's a great opportunity right let's do it Oh, and by the way, Portland was an hour or so and change from Linfield. And by the way, I was still playing football. Oh, and by the way, we need to do the 5 a.m. class. Got it. Great. Well, I worked for my dad growing up in road construction. And if it's a 5 a.m. start and you show up at 4.45, you're fired. Mm. Like, you're fired. So I'm like, okay, 
if that thing opens up at four at 5 a.m., I need to be there by 4.30. That means I need to leave. If it's an hour drive, I need to leave at 3.30. But, but I not got a good drive. Like, that's not an easy drive to go no. from Minville to Portland, by the way. No. That means I need to leave an hour and 15 minutes in case something happens because I, I got a $600 car, right? I got something crappy. I don't want to be late. So that means I'm getting up at 2.45 or something like that. And I'm driving my way up there every day. Oh, and I'm getting paid minimum wage, which barely covered my gas, you know, like all this stuff. But fine, like right. not the point. Absolutely, I'm doing it. So I'm there. I'm getting there 45 minutes early. And I ask after a couple of days, my manager, hey, like if I'm here 45 minutes, can I just come in? Like I'll leave the lights off, but I, can I open up the doors in case somebody shows up early? Uh, you want to get here 45 minutes early? Well, I don't want to, but like I feel like I, I need to because I don't want to be five minutes late. Right. Okay, yeah, sure. So I start opening up the doors. Well, you know who starts showing up 15 minutes before opening, 20 minutes before opening? It's not the people who are getting paid minimum wage to work at Adidas. It's the people that got to go catch a flight to Beijing the next day or got to go, I got a 6 a.m. It ends up being all the executive board members, mm. right? I'm not supposed to personal train, not not like loud, but like right. we're not, we don't get paid anything to do it, right? I'm there to just check the enlist. So while I'm there, I open up, they're like, hey, dude, you're here. Great, can I get in? Yeah, of course you can. Well, hey, well, can you help me out this? Yeah, sure. So I start doing that and I start picking up people, more people. Like, hey, will you coach me? Sure, sure, sure. One of those people, ended up being on the board. Two of those people started, well about half of them worked at like the coffee shop on campus. Every single person, it's like, before, I didn't know who any of them were, but they, they, all got the same, they all got the same treatment. They all got the exact same treatment. And then eventually actually what happened was um, they started making a rule the coffee shop people couldn't work out for like whatever these reasons, they were separate employees. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, I'm not allowed to let you in, but hey, what are you doing at home? What do you got at home? There's a field over here. Uh, let, me, let me give you some ideas. When they, they still come, they walk by the office, say, what do you think of a dude? Okay, I give them ideas. Like, I don't give a shit. Like, this is something you think, it takes me, boom, at that point in my life, you have time, mm -hmm. right? And they're trying to get it out. So they all got the exact same treatment for me because one, I didn't know who any of them were and I didn't want it. I didn't want to look them up because you could, yeah. like, this is not a direct thing. Exactly. Well, it turns out all this stuff and a few months in, the guys were like, wow, like you're really good at this stuff. Hey, I know what, we just started sponsoring Mark Verstegen. He's got a place down there. He's looking for people for January, boom. We want you to go down there. We're gonna actually take care of it for you. We're gonna send you down there. I'm like, okay, so I, am I like a contract then I gotta come back and work for you? Like, no, no, no. Like we just, we, we think you deserve this to go down there. So they took care of me to get down there and everything. I'm like, then I land there and like every single point, and there's a story from there to me, like there's more of these yeah. stories. I still land all these stories. But all of it goes back to me willing to do something where there was a, a virtual zero chance that that was ever going to pay out for me. Mm -hmm. That one happened too, but that doesn't count the 35,000 other times I did things like that, that nothing was ever made of. Yeah. But you don't get those opportunities early in your career until you put yourself out like that. When you're like when you're in that age, you're, that part of your career, the answer is yes, and it doesn't matter the time. It doesn't matter the pay. It doesn't matter if there's a direct benefit. It doesn't matter if you like it. The answer is, if it's gonna help somebody, if this is a good cause, yes, yes, yes. And if you do that enough and you treat people well and you do things that are really helpful for them, you're gonna get these big breaks. Like, that's how this stuff happens. Dude, that's that's such real talk. And, and hopefully you guys have heard this. It's a very similar message to a lot of people. Shimoni Shikawa, the sports scientist yeah. for the New York Knicks, like, you know, he's like, dude, I didn't even get to work out. I slept on therapy tables half the time because I got there at 3.30 in the morning. Yeah. So I opened the doors, I wasn't getting paid. And I show up so that way I could leave at 9, 10 p.m. I lived an hour away, mm -hmm. right? Rachel Balkovec, uh, first female strength conditioning coach, yep. you know, in Major League Baseball. And everybody, you know, if you guys are noticing this trend with every single guest has been on, everybody's put in the work. And that's why this story, yep. like, it's like we can sit and talk about physiology and muscle testing and fiber types. And, and there's a lot of avenues that you can listen to that from him. He's got a lot of work online. But I think it's really important that you guys understand that he had to work to get to where he is right now, which is where a lot of you want to be. A good Instagram following, a great research, a lot of uh, teaching classes, working with professional athletes. Like he does all the things that a lot of you want to do, but he did a lot of shit that a lot of you aren't willing to do. That yeah, for sure. At the beginning of his career. I mean, I, I got every single person I was made a break like that. Th it's something like that's happened. We, um, one of my former students, Gabe Rangel, uh, he's done a bunch of stuff. He. He's he's kind of if you can look up his stuff he's not really on social media but he he's had just tremendous success before the age of thirty, uh, still having having amazing success. What people don't realize he was training, uh, God, I, I may miss the exact name here, but it, so don't kill me if it's the details wrong. But you get the point. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was training like not Odell yet, but he was training um, Ty, uh, Terrell Pryor, um, 
when he was still a quarterback, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, probably 25 NFL players. He was training them, and he was sleeping on the gym floor at the same time. Mm -hmm. He had made it. Like, he was training NFL players, a bunch of them, and he had no money, and he wasn't getting anything. He was there so much, and he was hiding it. Like, people didn't know he was sleeping yeah. on the gym floor. And one time, he, he told me this amazing story where there was a – there was the, the guy um, – Oh God, the guy's name—I forget his name—but he was the guy behind all the money in the NFL. Uh, he's like Jerry Jones's guy. He, oh he, yeah, yeah. He, I forget his name, but he's the guy that like, like, all right, you, you want to get in like this, you got to be in with this this money guy. And he's a real straight up dude. Uh, and this NFL player was in, and he showed up to the gym super early or something, and, and caught Gabe basically. And he's like, "Are you sleeping like here?" And he was like, "Uh, yeah, yeah." Like, kind of, whatever. here, and, and he started, like, teasing Gabe about it. And this guy jumped on him and was like, who, like, just laid into this, this NFL player. Because he, he, I guess, he's a he's a billionaire now. But he had made it for years sleeping on the floor. He was an athletic trainer to start. Uh -huh. He was sleeping on the athletic training tables for, like, a, a, a half a year working yeah. for the Bulls or something like this, right? So he sort of protected Gabe. But, like, Gabe was training the biggest of the biggest NFL players. He's being flown around, asked to speak conferences, moved all around, and he was still sleeping on the floor. Mm -hmm. And he was he kept hiding it because he was just like, I don't have any money. Like, there's actually, I'm not getting paid here, but I, I got to do this. Like, every single person I know that had these breaks is willing to do something where you're like, yeah, this is going to really suck for a while. Mm -hmm. but you want to get there, man. Like, you've got to really get after it. He told another amazing story. He was a, a, a Marine Special Forces guy. I forget his exact thing. It wasn't a ranger, but some other thing. Uh, he, he couldn't get through marksmanship school. Like, he couldn't. He's skilled. Yeah. He was a terrible shot. He didn't grow up shooting. Like, you know, he's like, I'm shooting against country boys who grew up in Kentucky their whole life. Right. He's like, I'm a city guy from Oakland. He's like, I never touched a gun. He couldn't Weird. I thought city kids from Oakland did touch guns. Well, okay, fair, you know, <laughs> fair enough. That was a good one. But he's like, I couldn't get through. And so he said, we happened to have the best shooter in the Marine Corps was in that, that uh, stand at the same base. So mm -hmm. I was like, I went up to him and asked hey, will you give me lessons? And Gabe was like, no. Like, again, like we talked about, Gabe had went up and asked him for a bunch of stuff. Yeah. No, not going to happen. He begged him. No, not going to happen. Beg, not going to happen. And he pulled the, well, I'm not going to leave your door until you do. And that, that, that doesn't work on another Marine. Yeah. Because like, don't care. Right. Not going to happen. And then Gabe thought, okay, how about this? Guy had two little kids. He's like, I'll babysit your kids uh, for uh, whatever it was, a week for one hour of lessons. And Gabe was like, nope. And he's like, fine. Well, he ended up babysitting his kids for like three months or two, some really long time. And the guy was like, fine, I'll give you one hour. So he'd do all that work. When he got out there, the guy gave him an hour. And then he's like, okay, and that ended up stretched to two hours or two and a half or whatever it happened to be. And he, he barely, he passed just enough to pass. But he also realized, he's like, okay, like, here's the difference. I only have to be able to outwork, but I also have to be able to create value mm -hmm. for somebody else. And, and at this point, like, if you really don't have value, that's okay, but you can provide value in other ways. So maybe yeah. he couldn't give this guy anything, but he didn't have a skill set with kids or babysitting. Mm -hmm. But he's like, okay, like, I can do, you don't have a skill set probably in cleaning the toilets. You have a skill set in building a website. Fine, learn. Mm -hmm. Fine, like, learn whatever it is where you can add some sort of value to other people. And every time you get breaks like this, it's because of you, you put in something that helps somebody else. Solve a pain point. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And figure and, out what it was exactly for him and, and then do it. Yeah. yeah. And, and do it with a humility, or essence of humility. Yep. And uh, go in and just shut the fuck up and work. And maybe something else is going to happen with him. Like, even yeah, with, yeah. Like with Adidas, right? You know, it was nine well, months he ran later. The, he ran the risk, too, of that, doing that babysitting. And the guy didn't promise him anything. Yeah. He ran a real risk of that guy still going, great, thanks. Yeah. Still not going to do it. And that probably also happened to him a thousand times. So, like, that was the one success. But you have to realize that it may not work. Mm -hmm. I may not I got that break with Adidas but I can tell you a hundred other stories of doing things like that that didn't end up anything yeah so you have to realize that that's part of it and yeah you have the humility and you go great well, that was a learning experience and you'll never know when that will come back you and, never know and a lot of people wait for breaks to happen but realistically those breaks are created absolutely you know what I mean like absolutely. oh man why can't I just catch a break I just finished school I want to intern it on it and I want to do all this stuff and it's like well you're up against a kid that moved here from England yep to be a member that paid paid to be a member yep. paid for three certs in a row was yep. getting to the gym every morning at 6 a.m leaving at 9 p.m when we close and just wouldn't go away yep so then he's like i made a comment about like god i hate this the mess over here yeah. and uh i came in the morning it's all cleaned up all yeah the yeah those are lined up real nicely yep and i'm like 
tell you what, dude, I'm the person that schedules every cert, like, and, and brings in all the education. You want to come to FRC this weekend? You're coming to FRC this weekend. You yep. want to come see John Vesson? Come see John Vesson because you put in more work and yeah. haven't asked for one thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I love it. That's exactly, that's, I mean, that's the beauty of it. It's not like ask to work for free. Yeah. Oh, ask her. No, I'll pay. Yeah. I'll pay for this, and then I'll pay for that, and I'll pay for this, and, and I'll go do this, and I'll, I'll do these extra things. That, that's really how you get to that. Yeah, because you got to, how many people want to intern here? Millions. Oh, yeah. Come Millions. on now. Like, yeah. same thing. Like, that's the extra step. That's how you get there. And that probably put that dude in credit card debt. Probably. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> He's just like, dude, dude, you don't know. That's the best part. He yeah. didn't complain and whine a bitch. He didn't also go to the to be like, to show you that. Yeah. Like, he could have a million dollars. He could have credit card debt right now. You don't know. And you, and you shouldn't know. Yeah. And now you're likely to give him the break because that part doesn't matter. He's not holding that over your head. At all. Because he's taking the value and he'll come up to me. He's like, oh my God, that was the best seminar. This is what I liked about it. I'm like, dude, I wish there were 9 million versions of you. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then, you know, I don't know if he has an exercise science degree. You know, he he was a bartender in England. Yeah, yeah. And he showed up. He wants to change his career around. Right? But then even like for you, it's like, all right, you show up to University of Memphis, right? And you go get your master's. And uh, then it was like, you know, at this point, your network's a little bit more established. You've been working at Exos or Athlete Mm. Performance, right? And you're still in there with Doug, and you, mm-hmm. and you meet Mike Bledsoe out there, and and uh, you know what happens after you guys get out there? You guys all get to hang out, and um, yeah, it was actually really cool. We we had kind of we kicked around a little bit. We were training, competing, and basically doing everything together. The sort of five or six of us, and uh, Mike was like, "I want to open up a CrossFit gym," and uh, this was 2000 and probably seven. So right when CrossFit really started to like come to, like it wasn't in mainstream, but it was no. starting to like. There was one, the one CrossFit on MLK in Portland was around, and that was the only CrossFit right. there. And then, yeah. There, there was no CrossFit Memphis. Yeah. So he opened up the first CrossFit Memphis. That's how open a, the game was. So I don't know if there was 30, 40, 50 gyms or something like that, but uh, relatively small compared to, what do they got now? 5,000 or, right. I don't know. In downtown alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. <laughs> and so I was, I was joking with you before we started shooting. Like, he, he wanted to open up that gym. And I was like, that's the stupidest idea ever. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and all of us were like, that's dumb, CrossFit's stupid, blah, 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 whatever. And then um, I went on to get to, to get my PhD, uh, so I moved up to Indiana, and I was working on that, and those guys had stuck around, because they're like, we want to run this sort of thing for a while. And uh, Chris was still working at Smith & Nephew, the orthopedic place, and, and, and doing his sort of nine-to-five corporate thing, and, and Doug... Went to Australia for half a year or something. Mike was running the gym. They kind of circled back and they realized like, hey, maybe we actually want to do this together. And then I got an email one day out of the blue with just a bunch of MP3 files. It's like from Mike and I click it and open it and I listen to it. I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and it takes a moment. Like, there was no context to the email at all. I'm right. like, what the fuck is this? I called him or whatever I did. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about doing a podcast. I'm like, first of all, what the fuck's a podcast? Second of all, that's the <laughs> stupidest thing I've ever heard. You are terrible on a microphone. You don't have anything interesting to say. Like, you don't know anything. And so, of course, you know, Barbell Shrug launches. It's the first real fitness podcast, right. you know, or, or whatever. And <laughs> it's it's massive. So I was telling you earlier. They're 300 episodes in now. Yeah. I mean, they got millions of dollars behind it and, and all of this stuff that they've done. <laughs> So if you ever, if I ever offer you business advice, please <laughs> do the exact opposite. I feel like I can offer advice on some things. Business, is <laughs> um, So I went to the PhD realm. Yeah. So I went and got that while they were crushing. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I got to, to come down and do a lot with those guys and, and did a lot of the early shows with them and stuff. Um, Why did you go get your PhD instead of go to like... PT or DC school or even go back to sports performance because I had a master's I had gotten um I had a couple of surgeries in high school and I had worked with some physical therapists and thought this is the most boring <laughs> uh least rewarding thing I've ever seen in my life I mean they're printing out sheets and three sets of ten of a two pound bar- I'm like this is this is what you do all day so although I didn't intern with them I knew immediately from that experience like this is not what I want to mm-hmm. do uh it also didn't it, I, I am the type of person that I don't really care about income. Of course, we all would love more. For sure. No doubt. Um, but I, I, I feel really suffocated if I don't have a hole in the ceiling. Mm-hmm. So I don't really care if the ceiling is, is five feet tall, as long as there's a skylight. And if that skylight never opens up, fine. I, I honestly, I really have realized I don't really even care. I just like the idea that, hey, you never know. Mm-hmm. Like, you never know mm-hmm. what could happen. And I felt like if I went into physical therapy at the time or strength conditioning, 
that there would be no skylight. Like this is what you're you're going to do. Your your margins on a gym, uh, unless you franchise or do things like that. Like you're just your margin as a coach is this is your salary period. Mm-hmm. You're going to make four hundred thousand dollars or forty thousand or whatever it is, but that's it. And I didn't like that. Like I wanted to have the opportunity to have autonomy in my life. That was one thing I learned working with my dad in a job that you do not have autonomy at all. Mm-hmm. And I wanted autonomy. Um, and I wanted the wanted the, the hope to hit the lottery without having to literally buy a lottery ticket. And, and that's really what I cared about. The hope to me was more important than the actual cash. So uh, I didn't want to do those things. And I also, like, I didn't have great experiences. Not that anybody was mean to me or I don't give a shit. Like, mean to me is not going to offend. Like, that's mm-hmm. not going to stop. I don't, I don't care about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just like, that wasn't super rewarding to me. And I didn't feel like anything I was doing was really helping anybody's lives. And, and that's one of the things that drives me. And so I'm like, I don't want to go into this field because, I don't know, you caught a few more balls this year, but you kind of did half the workouts. We were negotiating, you know, like all this stuff we talked about earlier. Yeah. So it just wasn't going to jam for me. And, and I'm also uh, identify as, as a creative. I feel like I can't really express my creativity in those forums. So I didn't want to go those routes and I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. And I'll, I'll, I'll still make the cliche joke, like I still don't know. <laughs> I am, I'm tenured yeah. and I, I still don't know. Like, that's why I do cool stuff like this, honestly, by the yeah. way. Because I'm like, hey, this is, this is, this is what I did it for. Mm-hmm. This is why I did it is because I knew that I would get opportunities that they wouldn't get, not because I was smarter or better, know any more information, but because I had DR in front of my name, mm-hmm. or officially a PhD behind it. Uh, and I would get opportun- right, get opportunities that they wouldn't get, and I don't know what those opportunities would be, Yeah. but like I just wanted the door open. Mm-hmm. And, and that's um, that's what I wanted. I had no geographical things fine to me. Uh, I didn't have anything where I had to make sure I was paying. Like I had a fortune in my family's in health. I don't have anybody who's, who's behind yeah. me, so I'm like, why not keep the doors open? And, and who knows what could happen, but I do know what's going to happen if I open up my own gym. Mm. Right? And I, I knew I don't like I don't like business. Mm-hmm. I don't like that learning those things. So don't play yourself in that game. Mm-hmm. Like don't play a game and then bitch about it. Hey, that's that's <laughs> real talk right there. Like don't be upset about the rules of the game you decided to play. Mm. I say this in science all the time. People always like, give me shit like, oh my god, I can't believe the money you've raised in your lab, or the things that you've done. I don't have a single federal grant. I've never brought any national NIH funding in. Like, how the hell do you do this? How do you do social media? Because uh, people are generally, most of my colleagues, like, look down upon all those things mm-hmm. because, you know, all the time I spend doing this, I probably could have gotten a paper out today, right, or finished another study. I'm like, how the hell do you get away with this stuff? How does your administration not kill you? I'm like, well, because I publish almost as much as you do, and also because you think I'm playing the same game as you. Mm-hmm. It looks like I'm failing. I'm not playing your game. Right. I found a game that nobody was playing and I played the crap out of that and I've got major success relative to, to my own stuff. And my university loves it because I'm doing a bunch of stuff that nobody else has done and I didn't get in line with your game, which I knew I would fail at. Mm-hmm. I knew I would fail it. So don't bitch about the rules of the game you decided to play. Don't play the game. Find another one to play or make your own game up. And then that's really how I approached my academic career and why I did this. I was like, well, I don't want to do the science the normal way because I hate that normal stuff. And I don't want to coach all day because I actually don't like that. What if I just created a career where I get to do as much or as little of any of the stuff as I wanted? Fantastic. Yeah. So I went to a place that, like we are talking about, it's not research heavy per se. I don't have grant pressure, but I get rewarded for doing that. Like I'm on sabbatical right now. Uh, I'm 34 years old, I'm tenured, and I'm on sabbatical. And I don't have a single federal grant. And people are like, how the hell, like my university, I'd be fired by now. Like, yeah, but you don't realize all the other things I've done that you've never even tried. Mm -hmm. And when I interviewed for that job, I told them my vision. And this was not the vision that they thought they wanted, but I convinced them this is the vision they need. And so they're happy because I'm killing it based on the exact same metrics I told them I wanted. Mm -hmm. I convinced them of that. Then when I knock those things out the park, they're like, oh my God, you're crushing expectations. But I set the expectations first. I didn't play the expectations as they laid down. Um, and, and that was all part, you know, part of the negotiation and stuff. And when I came in and interviewed, I was like, this is my vision. This is what I want to do. And they're like, oh, I'm not, ooh, not really sure here. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. no one do, does that or is doing that. And then they, they bought in. And then I just knocked it out of the park so fast. They're like, oh, my God, yeah, yeah. Um, we don't know what you're going to go do. But you said you need six months. Okay, cool. Like, we trust you because you've just been smashing everything. And I've already done a bunch of art things that just 
lined up super well for the university and they're like oh, yeah dude like now i've got the clout to yeah well they'll take a risk on me uh to do things like this so but but that's again because like those are the ground rules i set up and nice. that's that's a vision i had and i think that's super important and we've talked about this before on other podcasts like making sure that your goals and your desires line up together and, and yeah. managing expectations from the front end, right? Yeah. Um, you didn't want to play the game of like, I was held down by 9 million grants to do a study that, because a lot of research and a lot of you are a lot more educated than I am, but a lot of studies, especially in the collegiate realm, isn't that you necessarily get to do your own research. You know, it's you're reinforcing something that's already been proven. Yeah, or a bunch of other, I mean, there's a bunch of, of crap and I don't want to bore you talking about the nonsense, stuff, but yeah, this is a bunch of stuff that ends up being super deflating. Yeah. Uh, and then you could argue it's a, it's a huge waste of actual money. Yeah, and so like, it, also don't get me wrong, there's a huge portion of my job I hate. Yeah. Like I don't have the perfect job by any means. Mm-hmm. I whine a bunch about it and can ask Natasha. Like, <laughs> uh, so this is not perfect by any means, but I'm generally very happy with, with where I'm at. It's the only My only bitch and complaint is the fact that I have to live in LA. Mm. Man, if I could just get out, go live in like Roseburg or something. Yeah. In wine country yeah somewhere that'd be right. great but yeah. um you know and that you know like that um you know but like like we we're uh th- this is gonna like this is a bit dicey to sort of get out but i think this is an important message if you can stick through this like this is a good example of when i ran when the, when the book came out mm-hmm. uh i just assumed when you sold a book to a publishing company that like that was your part and they did everything else mm-hmm. turns out not 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 how it works folks <laughs> <laughs> not how it works at all so i assumed um you know like i sell the book to them and it comes out and they get me on all these shows and they do all the funnels and they and they optimize they don't do literally anything like when that book hits done like they're out this is basically what they're done for and that's why i realized before when i when brian and i were, were talking about the book and when i decided to when i agreed to it i sat down by myself and i thought okay what would you, what are the things that would have to happen for you to consider it to be a success, and what would be a failure? And I had identified three things that I thought if A, B, and C happened, I'd consider it success. Not any of A, B, and C had anything to do with finances, because mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about the book industry, but I knew enough to know like people apparently say you don't make money on books mm-hmm. uh, unless you're Tim Ferriss or you know something like that, right? One out of ten billion authors. Uh, yeah, there's literally like ten million books on Amazon right now. <laughs> 10 billion so we were pretty stoked to get to number three at yeah. one point like that was pretty awesome yeah but uh yeah so i i wanted to manage my my own expectations mm-hmm. like that and i did get pretty bummed after a while when the finance picture started to run around but then i had to like so i still like reacted but sure. i still tell myself like you told yourself that that was not going to be a metric mm-hmm. and, and and it's hard so i knew that cognitively but emotionally it was tough to then still grapple with so that is also important like just because you know it when you're not feeling it that that's okay like mm-hmm. and i had to work through that stuff and, and it's, it's okay but um the reason what i'm getting to all this is i told you earlier i don't necessarily like business and i realized when this stuff came out like okay the book if you would have spent the time on optimizing sales figuring out um, soe stuff building a website behind it building a business around it because you really if you want to sell a book on your own now you have to have a business in front of it or behind it you're not going to move units without it. I mean, not real units. Mm-hmm. You're not going to sell 100,000 copies a year. And I realized, and we kind of pseudo tried to do that a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, I hate this stuff. Like, I don't want to waste my career now learning marketing. Right. I'm so, I'm so far behind. Or we can we can pay somebody 10 grand a day to come in and do our marketing, and then another guy thousand dollars an hour to, to you know do this. I'm like, I can do all that, I guess. Or I can say to hell with it, I'm not doing any of it. Mm-hmm. But it's really important because I'm a huge believer in personal responsibility. Mm-hmm. So I had to have a conversation myself that said, okay, it's not acceptable to not do something because you don't like it. Like that's not an excuse. So if you're going to make that decision to not do any of these things because you don't like them, you also have to accept the responsibility then of not making the money behind it. Mm. And that is the key. So I had to go, what are you more comfortable with? Not making a million dollars a year on your book sale or doing the thing you don't want to do and then maybe making some of the income or running that risk. But you don't get to bitch about it. Mm -hmm. You don't get to bitch about not making money on a book when you didn't do the work that you knew you had to do to make the money. So it's either or. You can't play both games. Yeah. I was able to make that decision to go, okay, like I really don't like this stuff. It costs me a lot emotionally. It costs me productivity and my students. I don't have interactions with my family as much, and I'm not willing to sacrifice that 
to even 10 or 20 or whatever the number would be to X my sales. Mm -hmm. But that has to be a conscious decision. And now you don't get to complain about that. Th that's your responsibility. That's amazing. So great, amazing self insight. Yeah, it's tough, dude. I mean, like, again, it wasn't just like I was able to say that you have to work through those things yeah. and it sucks. But you, you don't you don't get to have it both ways. And you, you can't I hate people that whine about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I had to accept responsibility going, yep, you're going to make this choice so that you can spend more time hanging out with friends. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now that needs to be put in the category of recreation now, doesn't it, Andy? Mm -hmm. That's a recreation, huh? Yep. Mm, yep. Yep, it is. That's not a work thing now. Okay, now you're choosing recreation over income. I don't complain about it. Mm. Like this has to go into your time allotted for playing or vacation day when you say I don't have a day off yes you did because you did that mm. that's vacation time remember because I didn't lead the income you so chose to do it you chose to do it like that so uh, it, it's tough and we're not perfect at it but that was just the mentality I had to put forward on things like that had I gone back and done it again or if I ever do a book again I don't think I will <laughs> <laughs> but what I would do is say you know what I don't want to do that so before we sign this deal, we need to sign on to a marketing or sales team or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I give whatever percentage away or something like that. I think that marriage would work very, very well. Yeah. But we didn't establish that before and I think it'd be too complicated now. I said, okay, fine, or maybe it won't, I don't know. I'd be willing to have those discussions. Um, but like that, that's the thing is like, if you don't like doing it, either accept that it's not gonna happen or pay somebody else to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you don't get to not pay anybody, not do the work and then why. Yeah. I mean, why did you write a book in the first place? Uh, so I don't want to go into the exact same yeah, three things. Cool. Sorry. Um, uh, there's just a, I try to give a lot away, but there's a certain line of things where I'm like, I don't, don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the main things Brian and I were, were kicking back and forth on, and I felt like this was something I wanted to plant uh, a personal flag in. Nice. And if it didn't make me fine, but this was a message I wanted to get out. Um, it was Brian's idea. Uh, he came out with the idea, and I was like, no, I'm not writing a book. <laughs> like, sorry, bro. Like, I'll do anything for you, but I'm not writing a book. <laughs> like, that meatloaf line. Like, I'll do anything but that. Like, <laughs> anything but that. <laughs> a lot of no's have turned into yeses in your life. It yeah. Like... I know, bro. Um, <laughs> in my, like, I'm sort of going on a tangent, but we'll, we'll come back to that. The, the, remind me to come back. Uh, I remember listening to a lot of Tim Tim's work, um, and Tim Ferriss actually contributed to the book, so he wrote nice. the, a piece of the book so I can say this not feeling like I'm talking behind his back because uh, we've had conversations before but he was a really good example of I, I listened to a lot of his early podcasts and of course you know four hour work week and stuff mm -hmm. like that are great but I, at some point I realized mm, I don't think I should be listening to his material anymore because when I was listening to his stuff I was at a point in my career where his advice was actually bad for me mm -hmm. I think his advice is his advice is phenomenal, and I'm getting closer to being in a place in my professional career where his advice is going to be really helpful. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that you should do things like um, be selective with who you're interacting with and being really things when you're early in your career. Mm. When you're early in your career, the answer is yes, yes, regardless of value. And you do you like you work you don't protect time. You go every it doesn't matter. Go yep. go 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 go. Once you've established things and you've got a business or success, then I think you then you pull that plug and go, okay, now I'm going to be strategic and you start saving time. I can't interact. Mm -hmm. Right. But I promise you when Aubrey was early in his career, if he would have checked his email once a week and he was trying to build on it, like that would have been <laughs> poor. Yeah. Very bad. It was not yeah. going to work. Right. And he needed to push down relationships and build things. Now he's at a career where he can do that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now he can work six hours a day or whatever. I don't yeah. know what he does. Right. He probably worked hundred hours a day still, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but that was what I had to realize. Like, okay. I need to understand when to integrate these things. And that was a point in my career when I didn't. So when Brian approached me about the book, I was still at a point where I'm like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I need to start saying no to some things. And I've said yes to basically everything in my career so far for mm -hmm. the opportunity cost. But now I'm actually starting to build success and I have potentials. I have a lot of things to choose from and I can't do all of them. And I'm going to have to say sort of no to this one. And then, <laughs> you know, like Brian, he, that, he didn't let that go. <laughs> uh, he's a pretty persistent dude and I, I didn't just like with Mike in the gym I didn't see the vision mm -hmm. and he was very good about showing the vision and I was like oh yeah no this is the same thing I've been screaming and no one's listening and you from a scientific perspective and this is something he's been screaming from a practitioner perspective and he's like well, wouldn't it be cool if we could write a book that had both the scientist and a practitioner talking 
in the same voice about some of these issues of technology. And I'm like, cool. And then I also was like, I'm not, I don't want to write, I hate whining, right? Uh, uh, Roosevelt said, you know, when you complain about something and don't offer a solution, we call that whining. Mm. So I'm like, I don't want to just complain without giving a solution. Yeah. And he's like, cool. So I'm like, I'll do this if we can do this, but we also have to talk about solution. Um, I don't think we did that maybe as well now as I hope we would have. I think we would have done more of it, but I, I think the, the message is there. Mm-hmm. Um, Version two, bro. Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't, sorry, Eric and Victory. Version two ain't coming, man. They've been hounding for it. I'm like, no, not going to happen. Show me a real page. <laughs> um, so I mean, honestly, wrote the book because I was like, this is something I'm, I'm very, very, very passionate about. And uh, I think it is an important message and helpful. Mm-hmm. I think we can really help people's lives. I'm also not interested in doing things that are um, hackery for the sake of circumventing process. Uh, I like doing things that are more elegant solutions that are outside of the box. I love that. But mm-hmm. I don't like hacking in terms of undercutting processes. Yeah. That just always loses. Mm-hmm. So for all those reasons, I'm like, okay, I think we can do this in a way that that accomplishes all those goals. So that's really why we put it out there. Um, I felt like it had mass appeal too, that I could help a lot of people in a lot of different areas, which is also something I'm very enthusiastic about. Uh, I work primarily with professional athletes. Mm-hmm. So sorry all of you that have reached out to me since Joe Rogan. Like, I'm probably probably going to say no. Uh, athletes, I know if you're in the like still, I don't, I, you know, I, I'm very selective with who I work with. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't happen to me in world champions. Um, I mean, I work with some like professional wrestlers not like WWF, but like, you know, real wrestlers. I love you wrestlers. And they don't make any money. Um, some of them do, but most don't. Um, so it's not about that. It's just like I'm very neurotic about yeah. what drives me. Something that makes me super curious. you got to be fulfilled internally. Yeah, so, I mean, there's not going to be a version 2.0, um, yeah. and, which is okay, right? Because it wasn't important to you. And so the message that you wanted to get across mm-hmm. um, was being able to articulate um, where technology interferes into... Uh, fitness and, and what the line is, right? And so yeah. uh, the book is called Unplugged. I know we've said it a couple times. Uh, check it out. Uh, there's a lot of podcasts out there he's been able to be on describing the book and talking about it. Check it out. It's on Amazon. Uh, yeah. Go to drandygalpin.com. Uh, right? Andygalpin.com. Andygalpin.com yeah. and pick it up there. Um, but yeah, it was mostly, you know, what was the driving factor of why you even wanted to write a book? Yeah. And then you were you were looking at, um, you know, the personal fulfillment of what you were trying to do because it was it was a, a flag you wanted to stick in the ground. Yeah, you know, I want the the message was the fact that, you know, I see people misinterpreting science a tremendous amount. Yes, and Brian saw the same thing coming from the coaching perspective, and so I, I wanted to just, you know, put a flag up. It's just like, all right, stop. Mm-hmm. We have got to make sure if you're going to use so the subtitle of the book is evolving from technology to upgrade your fitness performance and consciousness and. Even that is slightly misleading because I'm not saying don't use technology. Mm-hmm. In fact, I'm making strong arguments for the use of technology in your training and fitness. But we have to use it judiciously. And if we understand, like we talked about earlier in the show, if you understand, okay, when I go to do A, there's potential consequences of one, two, and three, and there's mm-hmm. potential benefit of you know, these, whatever, then, then that's fine. But let's just have the awareness of that. And if, let's just not walk into situations thinking things are flawless and not mm-hmm. expecting consequences. Let's just plan for them. Then you can still make that same choice. I don't yeah. care. That's not the point. But the point is let's at least be conscious and aware of what we're doing. And let's not outsource our intelligence to a technology that is quote-unquote smart. Because mm-hmm. I promise you, we've had millions of years to evolve this little thing on the top of our head. And you really think... That three hundred dollar retail device <laughs> is smarter than that. Mm-hmm. It's not. You really think it's smarter than your coach's twenty eight years of experience? It's not. I'm telling you right now. Whether you look at this from personal experience, look at teleologically, look at this from um, the the research published on mm-hmm. these things. Accuracy is horrendous with fitness <laughs> technologies. Horrendous, particularly at high intensities. Some of them are good, some are better, some science really good. But if you look at the bulk of the research, there's been hundreds of studies now done. Uh, some percentage of them, 50, 60, 70% will give you a show great. The other 30% show terrible. And that's a huge, huge margin percentage. Uh, they also have very low validity. So validity means are they actually measuring what they tell you they're measuring? They're all, none of them almost, are, almost right. are. They're very reliable, though. They tend to give you the same number over and over and over again. Right. So that's good. Mm-hmm. Very important. So let's just talk about, let's not to shit on them. Let's just talk about what are they good at? What are they bad at? Yep. Let's not misappropriate them and let's use them 
It's yeah. not dogmatic. It's not the right or only way. Yeah. It's just a way. So I'll give you, I mean, quick work. I know we're getting close on time here, yep. but uh, we'll, we'll just go through a, a couple of quick things. Um, technology, fitness technology can be great for things like awareness, right? They can be great for calibration. They can be great for accountability, right? They can be um, great for early motivation. Mm -hmm. All these things are great. So if you ever have a situation where you think you need any of those things, please integrate them. However, they tend to be very, very, very bad for long-term sustainability. They tend to be terrible for accuracy. They don't understand context, right? They don't understand strategy. They don't understand why. Mm. They're very, very limited in their approach. So they have real, real problems like that. I mean, we could give an example. Um, there is, there are uh, smart technology. What, pick, pick your favorite one. We'll uh, let's say Omega Wave. Okay, Omega Wave. Fine, great, uh, fantastic. If you're not familiar with that, um, that's one of the many uh, really cool ways to measure overload stress. Yep. So if you have a crappy signal in the morning, maybe that's the day that you take a day off. If it's great, maybe you can go. Okay. There's more detail on there, yeah. but you get the basic idea. Awesome. I remember having a conversation with Cal Dietz, and Cal is a longtime strength conditioning coach for the University of Minnesota. He's got a bunch of Olympians and All-Americans. and Wrote a very successful program, tri basic training. Tri-basic training. training is fantastic, right? Cal's spoken a lot. He's great. And I had a conversation, and I asked him about HRV and Omega Wave stuff. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I use it, but people misuse it because they don't understand context. I'm like, well, what do you mean? So he said, if you have a day that you wake up and your omega wave says, hey, you're at a 9 out of 10 on fatigue scale, do you take the day off, yes or no? He's like, well, that depends. What is the purpose of the day? I'm like, oh. Oh, what? Whoa, whoa. Hmm, what? Like, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, automatic red doesn't automatically mean day off. Automatic green doesn't make automatically training day. He's like, no, no, no. It depends, and so in this particular example, he's like, "Look, if I'm if I'm in the preseason, or we're three weeks out from starting our football season, for example, and we wake up with an omega wave in the red, right? A red scoring being bad, we're probably going to take the day off. We're going to maybe work on mobility or position or do cool therapy or breathing mechanics or foot mechanics. Like we'll do something else, mm -hmm. right? It's not a, it's not a huge load, but if I wake up with that exact same signal nine months before season, and we are in the overload phase." Where we're trying to induce adaptation good we're still training yeah that's the point yeah and people you so like oh like so you can't just outsource so he uses the technology but he doesn't just automatically go well i'm not gonna think anymore mm -hmm. i'm just gonna do what this machine tells me it says take a day off take a day off that doesn't work because if you understand this this concept of adapting versus optimizing you realize, and then we're here at Honor, right? Human optimization. Mm -hmm. People don't understand. Optimization doesn't mean feeling great all the time, doing everything to feel as good as possible. Optimization is a result of a balance between recovery and stress, right? That's where we get. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we wake up and it's crappy and we're not feeling great, that's fine, good. Still, you got to still go here, guy. You're trying to induce adaptation. Mm -hmm. Adaptation is a result of overload, of stress. Now, if that's gone for too long, though, and you don't balance that with the recovery, then you don't get the adaptation or it actually gets things worse. HRV Omega Weight doesn't, doesn't account for that thing. It has mm -hmm. no idea what you're trying to do. Right. Doesn't also know, well, here's another fallacy with that. What is it to make you think you can't change that score? Uh -huh. You wake up with an HRV in the red, but yeah. you don't think you can, you can change that in five minutes? Yeah. You can. Yeah. Absolutely. Go do some breathing drills. Get in a cold shower. Right, do some warm up, do some mobility stuff. Well, all of a sudden, boy, now you're now you're green. Weird, mm -hmm. weird, right? Maybe not. Maybe you're still in the red. Okay, maybe then now I have a different answer. But to think that you don't have control of your physiology is childish, mm -hmm. and to think that you can just get a score like that of a really amazing technology. So th these things, and I work, I've consulted and been paid to work for some of these companies. They are fantastic technologies, but they are not necessarily good products. The tech behind them is super innovative. It's like, well, we've never had a thing that can integrate and the algorithms are fantastic, but they're built by teams of dudes that are from MIT that have never worked out in their life. Mm -hmm. And they change the algorithms all the time. So what the exact same thing, what gave you a score of red today might give you kind of red or yellow tomorrow or it might give you black. Well, they might change the whole thing and they're not telling you these things. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, the again, that's not to say they're useless, we just have to think that we can't automatically go, well, this, said that this, this DNA report said I don't process carbohydrates or fat. I guess I just don't eat carbs. Mm -hmm. 
come on, we, we, we got to think more through these things, especially if we're going to be in this field. Yeah. And people are coming to you as an expert and you're just then turning to what the watch said. Why am I paying you then? Mm -hmm. Get out of here. I can just do that at home with a, with yeah, a PDF. Exactly. Like if Justin Verlander woke up today in the red uh, and, you know, he's supposed to pitch today mm -hmm. to the World Series, probably not skipping a start. Too bad. Right? Yeah. Uh, you're, yes. you're getting paid $25 million a year. And this is actually why we pay you is to pitch game two. Do you know what it would have been like if I woke up every day not wanting to go to my job? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> Great, Sam. You got a meeting today. It's really important. And you know what? Your kid was up all night. Too bad. Mm -hmm. You have got to perform. Well, no, okay. We're going to match that then with an extra day of recovery when you can or something like that. Or you're going to do some other self-treatment or you're going to do some free, whatever it is to you that you like. Okay, fine. But some days are red. Great. Yeah can be good though maybe you start to realize you think you're feeling uh green but then you you have your omega weight and you look back and you go well, actually the last six nights five last six nights i thought oh boy i slept like crap mm. you know what maybe i need to cancel this meeting here to catch up or I, maybe i shouldn't go out with my friends tonight or whatever it's going to do maybe this email thing can wait wait till tomorrow because i really need to catch so it's good yeah for that awareness right but then eventually you should start to realize oh I don't need the omega wave anymore to tell me here are these actual physical signs and symptoms I get when I'm when my sleep is moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's what we should be using the technology to reconnect with our own physiology to help us identify what's really happening with our athletes or our own selves. Yeah. Then we've got a real win. But if we just again outsource that to the technology, what happens when that technology has changed mm -hmm. or it's wrong? It's wrong. Circumstances change, environment change. The technology changes. Technology we changes. We realize yeah. constantly, oh no, actually that wasn't what we were measuring at all. Yeah. Or that didn't matter at all. The analogy I give all the time is, uh, I heard this on uh, somebody's podcast um, and I love it. Like, what do you think it was like to spend six years learning, I don't know anything about coding, mm -hmm. but learning the coding language from 2000 and you get spent six years in college becoming a master of that coding system and then some dude named Steve Jobs goes, yeah, we're gonna do this differently now. <laughs> Yeah. Oops. <laughs> you went to mechanic school and you learned and you became a master, a world expert in engines. And then Elon shows up and goes, yeah, we're not going to use engines anymore. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Fantastic. You got to start again. Mm -hmm. You didn't actually develop a useful skill set. Yeah. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, all these rules are here, but it takes the person pushing the edge of the threshold of the rules to show us what we can do yeah right i mean when omega wave came out it was great when fitbit came out it was fucking great right yeah. and it, it, they don't not hold value yeah, yeah but it doesn't like just because you hit your ten thousand steps a day doesn't mean that you're going to be you know you were well if you look at the data on that specifically okay, not not fitbit doesn't matter but right. wearable technologies like that um the data is actually quite clear 90 some percent of people quit throw them away put them in the drawer within six months yeah nobody's losing extra weight uh my friend michelle just had some stuff last weekend came out. Uh, uh, her study showed that people with comorbidities, so people that have pathologies already sick, are twice as likely to get rid of their fitness trackers. Mm. They get they dump them twice as fast. And people that are given uh, these wearable technologies are actually twice as likely to gain weight or maintain their weight as people who don't. Mm. So the people that don't get it lose twice as much weight. Wow. Like, so what's that really telling you? Yeah. Maybe some people have success in it. Great, but the average person is actually not. In fact, the average person is going to get worse mm -hmm. with them. Why? Because they're not really solving the problem. In fact, if you look at the behavioral and the psychological research on wearables and on social media, by the way, uh, the vast majority of these things are demotivators. Mm. So while I love them, and if that motivated you and you've had success with people, like awesome, please do it. Yeah. But just, again, I, I'm, I'm not saying, to, what I'm saying is let's be aware. Mm -hmm. When you go to prescribe this to somebody, be aware. This could potentially motivate them. Cool, take advantage of it. It could also demotivate them. Right. So as you're coaching them through it, really be paying attention to signs and symptoms. Does it look like this is actually harming this person? Okay, then pull it. Yeah. Get it off the shelf immediately. Oh, it's great. They're having fun. They're, they're, all this stuff is going up. Their number. Keep using it. Mm -hmm. And that, that's just the awareness piece. I, I don't want to pro, don't go, get rid of all the, just be aware of going, all right, technology maybe is not always the perfect answer. Let's be judicious, judicious about it, implementing them and applying them. That's awesome. Guys, I don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole because we could have four podcasts in one day yeah. just on technology if we start getting oh them God. going. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
But, you know, as we start to wrap up, something that I, I really like to make sure, and you work with a lot of young students who are looking to get in the game, so I think that you're going to hit this on the head. Um, what's advice that you give your students, or what's advice that you want to give young, it doesn't need to be young by age, but young yeah. people getting into the industry to help them find success? And I'm sure you've already said it in the episode. Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, a lot of the things, like I said, is, is when you want something, make sure you're adding value to somebody else first. That's the way you get in. Yep. Add value to somebody else. In addition, uh, none of us are right. And if you find somebody who's screaming to the high heavens about they've got the magic, they don't. <laughs> it doesn't happen. We've been doing this for a long time as humans and no one's figured out the magic answer. We're not going to figure it out. Um, don't throw them out though. They may have good ideas, mm -hmm. but just put that in your mind and go, okay, I think this is really good stuff, but I'm also going to listen to the other side too. Mm -hmm. I made a thousand mistakes uh, about throwing things out. I mean, you pick it. Ketogenic diet, right? I hated that stuff because what we were taught in... In school, well, actually, it was taught by people who don't really know it. Yeah, and didn't really pay attention. Had never tried it. Never worked the money that I actually done. Well, now it's not great. There's a lot of problems, but there's some good there. Okay, great. There's always good. There's always bad. So mm -hmm. keep that in your head at all times. Uh, that I would think, and and be willing to go. Okay, well, you know, I, I took this course from Sam on kettlebells or or maces or clubs. Uh, he's done this a little bit more than I have. So I probably shouldn't walk out there going, I didn't like how he did this, didn't like it. You don't yeah. know enough to know that. Right. You don't know enough. Don't you say that. Right. You, no, you haven't earned that right at all. You haven't earned that right mentally to say that to your own self. Right. So um, those, those things are just not the good approach. So the, the way I can summarize that is, I think Dan Sullivan put this out there, but it's the difference between being a knower versus a learner. Mm. And you can Google that, go into all that, and you look at the traits, the language that knowers use and the language that learners use. And just, just very quickly, one example would be something like, uh, you know, Sam's doing this thing with the this spin and, and this overhead thing, and I know that the shoulder joint shouldn't rotate like that with load, so he's wrong. Or, hmm, I thought the I thought I learned in class the shoulder wasn't supposed to do that with load. He probably knows something I don't. Man, I'd really love to ask him. Hey, Sam, like I, I was taught this, but I, and I thought this was true. Like, what, what, what? How are you using it? How, how, how is this not hurting? Or are you seeing this? Without accusing him, because there's a way you can do it. Like, oh, I thought this one's put, and you're like, okay, now you're attacking me. Mm -hmm. Versus really trying to learn his perspective, and then you can still walk off and go, yeah, his answer wasn't very good. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe there's a problem here, or you might go. Almost always, you're like, uh, yeah, that's a thought. He probably knew something I didn't. Yeah, yeah. So be a learner, or be a yeah, be a learner, not an hour. That's awesome. Yeah. So where can people find you? Not that, that you want to get bombarded by social media messages, but people can follow your work. You post a lot of great stuff online, yeah. Facebook, yeah. Uh, everything else. You do give a ton of free value, so take advantage of that. Yeah, the, the social is easy. Andy Galpin, you know, on Facebook and Dr. Andy Galpin, DR, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can check out my my little mini-series podcast, The Body of Knowledge. Okay. iTunes, Stitcher, all that stuff. It's not a traditional, it's um, it's only nine episodes. Nice. So it, it's like a long-running story. And, and uh, Josh and Kenny Kane and I, uh, Kenny is a stand-up professional comedian <laughs> and has been coaching athletes and, and general population for like 25 years. And Josh is another PhD in statistics and human behavior stuff. So we, we write 30, 40 hours of audio and then condense it into like a 45-minute story. That's impressive. And the whole thing is just, it's like nine episodes a year. Yeah. So uh, that came out in the spring. The next season will come out in January, February, something like that. Nice. Uh, this will all be in the show notes, by the way. You can check that out. And then uh, my website, andygalpin.com. And like I said, that's free. Always will be free. Yes. Um, there's a Patreon account. If, if you want to contribute a buck or two, great. But if, if you're a student and you're like, hey, the difference between a dollar or two is the difference between like you getting a meal. Th don't, don't. I don't need your dollar. Yeah. Like, it, don't, don't do that. Uh, but if it's something that you don't have to think twice about, fine. But I, I, I don't care. The only reason I'm doing that account, honestly, is so that I can hire people to to, to do show notes and stuff mm -hmm. and to make study guides behind it and to put that information up there but um don't 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 at all extend yourself in any fame way to, to to contribute that page so that's all up there man that should be pretty easy to find awesome well when you see this guy floating around at nsca conferences or other other events uh pilsners or what he's feeling right now yeah. not a super hoppy ipa yeah. uh Come up with an attitude of wanting to learn, not just asking him like an immediate question. Find mm -hmm. out his story. Yeah. Uh, it's very, uh, it's a great to be able to have him on the show. He came all the way from California, which is great. Uh, he's been able to come in here and hang out in Austin for a little bit with us. Yeah. And, and I'll give uh, you one little hack as we're going. 
I love it. Okay, because I am not very good at networking either. I'm terrible at that stuff. So if I were to go to a conference like that, I'm, I'm very bad. I'm still, <laughs> I still am like, oh, Sam Pogue, like, God, I want to meet, uh, I'm probably not going to go mm-hmm. to it, right? Like, I'm, I'm very bad about this. And so one thing I have found very, very helpful is uh, don't set yourself up to fail when you try to introduce yourself to somebody who you really want to meet. And what I mean by that is the same, honestly, with trying to meet people, girls and guys at a bar. Have something to say. Like, just have something to say. So I, I've done this before, and I still do this. Like, I walk around for like half a day, going like, oh, what am I going to say to Sam? Okay, look, look, him, oh, he's got a thing on. Oh, he's got this. Okay, I saw him at this one. Okay, cool. And I might walk him, oh, hey, Sam, you know, hey, I'm Andy Galpin. Uh, I saw you at this cert thing there, and I was just saying, like, I really loved it, and it was great, and that's awesome. Oh, really great. And then, now all of a sudden you have a conversation to go, and it gets there. Don't just walk up, like, hey, man, huge fan. Thank you, that's really nice. That, that's uh, okay now what, what i don't know what to say yeah that. like that's super great so have something to say there and then eventually you can probably launch into your question hey i actually had a question about that um do you, do you have a quick second okay great because i'm really I've tossed up on the shoulder thing that you were doing i i, I feel like that was going to go on my shoulder what, and then you can get your question but if you have something really to break in other than hey i'm a big fan can i ask you a question i mean i, I probably still will mm-hmm. if i have time but but those are easy ways and i feel like you're going to get a more organic exchange uh and when you can actually be like oh okay cool like yeah, I'm interested in actually talking. This is going to be a fun conversation rather than like, ah, oh, shit, I got to go. I'm going to ask the question. Just <laughs> I so, love that this was your yeah. example because I was just on the Toolkit Summit uh, two weeks ago. And, uh, you know, like Zach Evanesh was on it. Daniel yeah, yeah. was on it. Christmas Abbott. And oh, God, was I love on, Christmas. Uh, He's great. Uh, program, or net programming, uh, networking. Mm-hmm. And, like, that was literally mm. verbatim my answer. Like, if you're not... For like, real? Yeah. For go, me, like... I'm so bad at that stuff. I'm the normal, like... I can, like you do. Though. I can go, yeah, I'm a networker. I can go into a room and fuck it. I'm going to meet every single goddamn yeah. person in the room. Yeah, you're good. But for you guys, for that aren't, like, super extroverted or don't like to be in front of people, like, put yourself in advantageous scenarios. Mm-hmm. Like, go in. Mm-hmm. Like, you're probably not going to do well in, like, just the random, like, meetup group. But if you're at a specific summit or you go up and, yeah. and you find the commonality, yeah, yeah. right? And then going up and asking an open-ended question or something yeah, yeah. that you're looking for clarification, not argumentative. And that gives yeah. them the opportunity to respond. Yeah. Like, if you go up and like, Andy, do you like tacos? And, and they're like, no. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. See ya. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like there was nothing to exchange, right? Versus yeah, yeah. like giving them yeah. context, allowing them to feed an answer yeah. that lets them go down a rabbit hole. Without also giving me a 35-minute detail of your history like I oh, I get those emails <laughs> I didn't need that like I did not need the history of why your knee pain is behind like what the what like I don't need that <laughs> <laughs> but Anyways. uh very yeah, much cool. thank you very much Andy for being on the show thanks for joining the fitness break room podcast uh look for Jessica to come in on Thursday with a break room breakdown thanks y'all have a great day Thanks again for listening to the Fitness Break Room podcast, everybody. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitness Break Room. And if you're looking to enter our monthly fitness swag giveaway, you can visit our website, fitnessbreakroom.com, and all that info is on the homepage. Hundreds of dollars worth of awesome stuff, so I wouldn't miss that. And then you can even subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and leave us a review if you're digging what we're bringing you. That would be awesome and very helpful. Okay, guys, have a beautiful week. Stay strong and always look out for the little guy. I know to you, it might sound strange.